And if you think I'm evil, well, just wait till you meet my very You're an interesting man. Scott Lang. What is going on, everyone? And welcome back to the channel. My name is Elliot. This is Movie Files. And as you can see from the title of this video, we are talking all things Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumanium. We're talking about the film spoilers, the twists, the turns, the post credit scenes, what next for Ant-Man's Ant-Man family, and uh, just the beginning of the Kang Dynasty. So we'll be diving into all that. And this is such a mega film not only is it the third ant-man film but it's also the launching pad of phase five so i couldn't do this by myself i have two special guests in the back room that's going to be joining us here shortly and i can't wait to pick their brains about this film and where it landed for them but before we bring them in and get this conversation started do me a favor if you all don't mind let's start the conversation in the comment section what you think about the film what worked what didn't work what did you think about the ending what it could mean for the scott lang and his family the post credit scenes how we would you rank this film amongst the other MCU trilogies? How would you rank this amongst the other Ant-Man films? Let's have those conversations. And of course, if you're enjoying the conversation, hit the thumbs up, share the video, all that fun stuff. It would mean a lot to me. So with all that being said, so stoked to have these two guests in. Uh, as we were talking about before we press record, there was a conversation we had probably about two years ago in regards to the Ant-Man. And these are the two biggest Ant-Man fans I know. So I'm so stoked to have them on. to bring in the one and only Amanda first. What is going on, Amanda? How are we doing? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here with you and our other special guests, which will come in soon. Um, but yeah, we we've always talked about Ant Man and this this third installment specifically and how it's going to be uh, it, with the rest of the MCU. So I'm I'm yep. really excited to dive into this one. And this is this is a big one, Amanda. We're yeah. here at Phase Five. You know, the MCU had its woes in Phase Four, and now we're here. We're in the new phase. Yeah. And did that man open it up to something special or maybe something a little bit not special? But we'll get into that. <laughs> but before we get our second guest in here, man, why don't you introduce, uh, introduce yourself to the people let them know who you are when they can find your content? Yeah. Um, well, I'm an entertainment journalist. I have my own website, candidxcinema.com, and uh, I dabble in a bit of everything. I just covered Sundance, so you'll find all of those reviews on my website. Um, and you guys can f always follow me over at AMX NDA Reviews for my rants, my hot takes. Like, it's on Twitter and Letterboxd and TikTok. It's like, that's where you guys can find me. But I'm always ranting about something, and I recently ranted about this movie right here. So you guys can check that out <laughs> because uh, apart from here, uh, it's just constant on Twitter that I'm ranting about something. So yeah, you guys can follow me there. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely do so. And uh, I haven't, so I haven't seen um, your review yet. I'm gonna watch it after we record this. So this is gonna be fresh to me. I'm not gonna. I don't know if you're yeah. leaning on the positive, or negative, somewhere in the middle. Uh, so I'm really excited to dive into this with you. And our second guest here, so excited to have him on because we've talked Marvel, we talked Star Wars, we talked DC, and we've talked about the inconsistencies of Phase Four. And now we're in Phase Five. I'm so excited to see his thoughts on this film and where we're headed moving forward. The one and only Griffin from film speak what's going on my man what's going on hey guys glad to be here glad that we could finally bring the ant fans together to talk about the <laughs> ant fam and have an antastic time i i'm ready puns, i'm puns. ready man. i love it i love yeah. it Griff. Yeah. so many puns i mean we're gonna have to throw in time so many different times throughout the conversation the ant the puns take a drink at home everyone for every time we drop a pun but <laughs> please, Griff, man, please do. before we get into the discussion my friend why don't you introduce yourself to the people at home yeah, so uh, I'm Griffin. I run the Film Speak channel. Uh, I do a bunch of video essays pretty consistently. So if you like, you know, deep dives into pop culture, film, all that good stuff, you can head on over there and uh, check out all the good stuff we have going on. I actually just uh, published a video today on the first Ant Man movie, which is one of my absolute favorites in the MCU. Probably my favorite origin story. Actually, not even probably. I think it is my favorite origin story in the MCU. So, uh, Go check it out. It's great. Yes, yeah. 
Ant Man and the first one. Well, again, we'll, we're very excited to get thoughts on that. And again, where it ranks with this other two films, and especially with this third one. But mm-hmm. listen, ladies and gentlemen, Griffin's information is in the description of this video, as well as Amanda. So do yourself a favor and subscribe to their channels. You will not be disappointed. Not only do they do movie reviews, TV reviews, and so much more. So definitely support these great content creators. So, Amanda, my man Griff, just to kind of car- start off this conversation as far as just. I'll start with you, Amanda. Just your fandom of the franchise thus far before seeing this third one and then transition to your thoughts on how Peyton Reed always envisioned this third film being the event film for Ant-Man. Was that the right decision based on the kind of groundliness of the character? So just your thoughts again on the Ant-Man franchise as a whole. You know, was it always a good idea to maybe have this trajectory of him having this big event film? Take it away. Honestly, I think because the first two Ant-Man films came after really big movies. The first one came after Age of Ultron. The second one Mm -hmm. came after Infinity War. So for this to be like the event film to push, um, you know, Scott Lang and whatever happens in Quantumania, like forward into phase five, I think it was a bit of a misstep because I love the family elements within the first two Ant-Mans. I think the connection between Cassie and Scott um, is something so dear to my heart because you barely see relationships between father and daughters that way on screen. And it just, it always put a smile on my face and I love that family unit. And it was a different family unit too. Um, and I think that they did put, they worked that into quantum mania, but it just felt like it wasn't an Ant-Man movie at the same time because of all the setups. So, um, I think it was a misstep. I feel like Scott Lang flies under the radar because of the yeah. placement of his films and the meaning mm-hmm. of his films, uh, whether they become, you know, they come after something massive or, you know, become in, like in the middle of something that's just multiversal and yeah. even bigger than we could ever imagine. It's like, right, I didn't think right. he would end up there. So, yeah, I, th- I think it was a misstep. I'll get into like, uh, my other thoughts about it afterwards it just sure. it, it felt weird i don't know it felt a bit weird for, for yeah. this third one weird is definitely one word i would describe this film as in, in both good way and, and also not so good way but I, i'm definitely with you in regards to i i I guess, Griff, just tossing it to you, man, did you, again, just your Mm -hmm. fandom of the franchise thus far, and did you always envision Ant-Man 3 potentially to be kind of the, again, as Amanda alluded to, not being a palate cleanser or being the appetizer before the big meal or the dessert after the big meal? Did you always kind of envision that for this character, and and do you think it worked for having an event for this character? Yeah, um, I think uh, for me... I, I liked, yeah, I, I liked the Ant Man films as like the palate cleansers. Um, although mm-hmm. I kind of hated that they became that because yeah. what yeah. endeared them to me was that they were standalone movies. They were like right. isolated adventures that took place in San Francisco. They really utilized San Francisco as a city. And True. like, yeah, they would like drop in like the fact that Ant Man was in Civil War and stuff like that. But like, they were their own thing detached from the MCU. So right. when you knew that Quantum Mania was going to be like kickstarting like this new phase or was going to be like ushering in whatever, I was like pretty off put by the idea because I was like, but that's not what I like about Ant Man. And yeah. I don't want them to kind of go in that direction because what I've always liked about them is literally everything that Amanda said, the family dynamic uh the the father and daughter sort of relationships seeing a positive father daughter relationship on screen contrasting yims and the van dynes with uh scott and cassie and like seeing how Scott and and cassie are almost like the second chance that that hank never was able to really have with his daughter i mean he kind of gets that second chance like a little bit later but just just sort of like paralleling the two fathers at different points in their lives and like the relationships they've had with their kids and like the mistakes they've made along the way uh, I, I thought it was a really genius idea because I when that first Ant-Man film came out and I and I heard that it wasn't going to be Hank Pym, it was going to be Scott Lang, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I don't know how I feel about that because Hank Pym is is such an integral character so to huge. Marvel Comics. Right, like, right. You know, but then when you see the film, you're like, well, he's not re- like he he doesn't really take a back seat. He's just older and there's like a younger guy there so that you mm-hmm. can kind of mm-hmm. have an interesting dynamic and you can build up a, a family sort of element. And that's why, uh, to me, the Ant-Man films were the closest the MCU had gotten to the Fantastic Four 
up yeah. until this point. Yeah. And even something with Quantum Mania, with like all like the wacky shit that's going on, that's very mm -hmm. fantastic for too, to yeah. to an extent. But um, I I just really like the focus on on character on on these relationships, uh, on just like low stakes with a big impact because mm. they it, it doesn't have to be this like world ending catastrophe yeah. or whatever like yep. it can be literally something that's just like stealing a suit from getting into the hands of of terrorists or yeah. just like yeah. stopping <laughs> you know this uh I, I forget like in the second one it's like the the car it's it's basically just like getting uh, the, yeah, the the, uh, the building, lab. With Pim's, and, yeah, yeah, inventions yeah. and tech I mean, and all that out there. Yeah, it, yeah, it, like it's all very, very simple stuff. But sure. the ramifications for the people involved are really are big, huge. and they're yeah. putting themselves at risk for something greater than them. Which is yeah. what I've always liked about Scott is that, like, even yeah. more so than Captain America. Like, look, Captain America is the poster boy, right? He is like just the shining beacon of positivity, of optimism, of just like. He's, he's almost too perfect. Then you have Scott Lang, who is just like, he's one of us. He's one of the everyday yeah. people, and that's mm -hmm. what I fucking love about him. And yeah. to Quantumania's credit, I do think they maintain that that core, that like emotional yeah. core. The relatability um, to the character, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the relatability to him and all that stuff, and the relationship with his daughter. And yeah. that was actually something that I was a bit nervous was going to get lost. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm glad that they, they maintain that. So, yeah, yeah you know... I, those are all the reasons why I've been a big Ant-Man fan. And so yeah, yeah. going into quantum mania, I was like, I, I wanted them to go into the quantum realm, but I wanted yeah. it to be just like a small scale, just sort of like, yeah. like land of the lost, like journey to the center of the earth, just sort yeah. of like Saturday morning TV special, like little adventure where it's yeah. not necessarily about introducing the next villain of the MCU, but it's more so right. about like, okay, these characters are now in the quantum realm. They'll, they're separated. They have to find each other in order to get out, which they court, they sort of do in this film. But yeah. along the way, you know, Scott and Cassie have to, you know, strengthen that relationship. And then, you know, obviously the Pims and the Van Dynes have to strengthen that relationship. And right. they almost had it in this film. But then they had to, like, kind of throw in, like, the, the setup for everything that was going yeah, on. And so, like, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's, like, smaller stuff in this movie that I really dug. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you know, going into some of the other stuff, I was just like, it, it felt like they were playing setup while trying to have a low stakes Ant-Man movie. Yeah. Uh, but, and and they didn't always work, but yeah. I, I will say at the end of the day, it was a, it was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Cause I was pretty down on the movie from just mm -hmm. like the get go. Just the idea of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. A, a lot to impact there. I don't, I definitely agree with both of you all as far as, now I'll be honest, I'm not uh, as big as enthusiastic about the Ant Man films. Uh, not because they're bad, but it's just I, I just never, I never. <laughs> this might sound bad, but I never took the films that seriously. Uh, just because, mm -hmm. as you guys had highlighted, they're they're always yeah. have been viewed as kind of these kind of okay we just had this big event film but let's bring it back down to earth and just hang out with scott and his family for a little bit so i've always looked at it that way like i almost thor look at and ant-man and me always been the two characters where thor is obviously the intergalactic space adventures but i never took those franchise that particular franchise too seriously so you know when we get a thor mm -hmm. ragnarok or you know even a love and thunder i was never too hard on the film because i never came in with expectations like up to a captain american iron man type of franchise so i enjoy scott i enjoy the dynamic and going into this one, it's funny, Griff, you said that the, the MCU influence, a la Kang, who we'll talk about, was some of the things that kind of, you know, obviously threw off the ground in this. But I think if it wasn't for Kang's involvement, I don't know if this film would have worked entirely for me, uh, just because of the way the script was kind of handling certain elements, yeah. which we'll get into. I, again, I was just so excited to get you guys on here because I know how much you love this character and this franchise. And I was just so curious on how you all felt about, again, the shift of this big scale as you just mentioned griff it's always been smaller scale with huge ramifications because if the suit gets in wrong hands like a darren cross or hydra i mean that is a world type of uh catastrophe in yeah. some matters and even ghosts yeah. having an advantage that she would have had in finding the, the building could have been huge ramifications but at the end of the day it was just it felt smaller where this is the complete opposite we are in the quantum realm which amanda just tossing it to you on this one as we kind of open up the film and again full spoilers for everyone at home uh we open up the film and i think to griffith's point it felt like an ant-man film for the first like five ten minutes when we kind of get that 
Scott Lang ma- montage of him, what he's been up to yeah. since in game. He has his podcast. He has his daily routine of getting his coffee, being quoted as to be Spider Man and not Ant Man, <laughs> which I found to be very funny. And Hope, she has her business now. And Hank and and uh, Janet are, are starting to rekindle what they lost for those thirty years. And Miss Cassie finds herself in jail, taken up for her dad. So your thoughts, Amanda, how we kind of kick off the film and kind of catching up to these characters that we haven't spent time with since 2019. Yeah, I think uh, it was a missed opportunity to have Michael Pena at oh, the no, very beginning. Don't even, that was a, a thing I had in my notes, I, Amanda. That was the worst element of this film. Where was my man, Luis? But go ahead. <laughs> I just, I don't understand how, if you're trying to fill gaps like they did yeah. with like, Paul right at the very beginning be like you missed this and you missed this like why wouldn't you have the one person like it just didn't make any sense but it was still funny don't get me wrong like yeah I think the the main thing that held this together apart from Jonathan Majors and Michelle Pfeiffer to be honest yeah yeah. was the humor because the humor in the Ant-Man films are it's very different than the rest of the MCU and Mm -hmm. that's the reason why I love the Ant-Man films even more because it's not dumb humor and if like people have been a fan of paul rudd they're going to be a fan of his humor and that's what runs deep in the ant-man trilogy now so that really held it together but this opening i thought it was it was good but it felt like felt so short because then we dive straight into madness right after and i was like okay let me let me catch my breath type of thing but i thought catherine newton was pretty solid as Cassie, I like seeing her. I thought like within the first moments of seeing her, I connected with her. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really hard to have an actor come in halfway through. Yeah, three films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. and I think she she was fine. She was fine. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best way to describe it because I feel like she's going to have to grow into this character now and like grow into this role. but I like that she was in jail. I was like, yeah, she was fighting for the little guy. And like, that's yeah. the main thing, man, in the whole family. So I think that they, yeah. they nailed those aspects that we love, as you know, we've been talking about yeah. right from the beginning. And then stuff and things happen. But we'll get into that after. But yeah. I mean, jumping off of that, Griff, and, and just your thoughts on this montage, but in particular, yeah, Cassie, I think it is to your point, uh, Amanda, it is, I would imagine, hard for an actor to not only be introduced to the MCU as like, you know, a young up and coming actress, but then also filling in, coming into the third film of a franchise, launching off the phase five, and then potentially, like Amanda alluded to, I think it's safe to assume that Stature will be, take, she'll be taking that mantle in the beginning of the Young Avengers eventually. So there's a lot of pressure on her, Griff. So just your thoughts on just kind of meeting Cassie in the position we see her in, but also just catching mm-hmm. up to the Ant-Man family and um, seeing where all they, what they've been doing for the last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the, the, the Catherine Newton thing, uh, I, I'm a big fan of hers. I think she's a phenomenal yeah. young actress yeah. and I, mm-hmm. I look forward to everything that she's doing and will be doing. Uh, so mm-hmm. seeing her cast as Cassie uh, was cool, but I, it, it's also when I'm, when I'm watching the film, I'm like, why did, why did she need to be in it? Like, why, why couldn't we have just gone with, the other actress yeah, kind of coming the, back and just playing online, that. Cause yeah. then yeah. it just, it just felt like a weird change up. Um, I think it was it's one not of those like, situations with the name maybe cause yeah, they want to do her way. as the young Avengers and Haley Steinfeld, yeah. Catherine Newton and whoever else. They they needed cast. Yeah. That's, that's Florence Pugh. yeah. yeah. Uh, sadly, yeah. I think you're right. That, that was, that was the case there, yeah. but at, I mean, you know, whatever Catherine Newton is great. I mean, she does, yeah you know, what she can with the material here. And it's not like she's yeah. given like the, the most screen time um, True. or like the, the yeah. most to do here. But what I do like is how they, they set up the arc of her, um, you know, looking out for the little guy sort of thing, like similar to uh, Scott at the beginning here. Like, yeah, she's, she's, you know, part of protesting. She's advocating for homeless rights in San Francisco, which uh, uh, fuck. Yeah. I love that because that's yeah. actually like a real issue yeah. in yeah. San Rooted Francisco. In reality. So. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Just like, oh, cool. So we're dealing with like real shit, not like right, made yeah. up stuff. So, um, yeah, that's cool. And then seeing her like kind of, you know, given the fact that she was raised by both her dad and a cop, it was kind of interesting to see her not that's necessarily true. be on the side of law enforcement, yeah. Be, yeah. showing that like she loved her dad because of the fact that he was willing to just sort of like disregard the law yeah. if it meant kind doing the right yeah. thing. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like that was really cool. And then seeing how that, you know, not to skip ahead too much, but then seeing how that kind of goes into her helping to lead uh, yeah, a bunch of, uh, you know, yeah. scra- freedom fighters, scrambled revolutionaries, you know, kind of unite them. Like that was a really yeah. cool arc voiceover for and uh, everything kind of reminded me of Iron Man 3, which I guess kind of, <laughs> you know, is... Yeah. depending on how you feel about that you can make of that as you will i really yeah. dug it i i i quite liked it a lot i thought it was it was funny there were a lot of nice little bits in there mm-hmm. yeah luis was was definitely oh, missed hard, a bit I, I gotta be <laughs> this is this might be my hot take as much yeah. as i love luis i think mm-hmm. they overdid his shtick uh in the, the previous like yeah the yeah. second go around <laughs> to the point where now i was just sort of like you know, I'm okay with him not being in this. Like, I know, oh, man, I know I he's probably out there him. somewhere, and they'll yeah. like, <laughs> reunite. And like, yes, he should have been in this, but mm. I, you know, I I'm okay with him not being in this movie and going through his like little weird, you know, storytelling, uh, storytelling yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that was fine. Um, yeah. I actually didn't mind uh, them getting to the quantum realm as quickly as uh, they did. It just, mm-hmm. it felt nice that the the movie had like a brisk pace going and I was just like, all right, I'm just here for the ride. Let's just get down in the, into the quantum realm and like right. just kind of right. see what's up. That, like that to me, the pacing, the kind of initial setup, the, the fact that like Scott's life makes no sense. There's just like all these different things of conflicting Am tones I, coming at baby? him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that was so it was, good. it was so good, and I'm just like, yeah. okay, yeah. I mean, like, this yeah. is just this is his life. It's cool. We set up the conflict of him trying to like prevent Cassie from going to jail and whatnot, and then we have like you know uh, Janet being a little bit closed lipped on like her time in the quantum realm because she's tra- yes. traumatized by that, which I know Amanda, mm-hmm. you have very strong opinions about, so I want to get to that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but then yeah, they kind of just like zip on down there, and we're just like, all right, cool, we're in the quantum realm. Like that, the yeah. whole setup for this thing. I know a lot of people probably will think it's like rushed or it's just like a little clunky. I'm not gonna say it's the cleanest thing, but I think for sure. me, I that that felt like the most like Saturday morning cartoon kind of setup yeah. to this like yeah. whole thing, which again. Again, is kind of what I wanted out of this movie. I, I wanted it to kind of have that like brisk, just like fun, low right stakes the, yeah. adventure feel. Yeah. yeah. So like all of that stuff, totally down for. Like was was enjoying the ride. Yeah, I, I can definitely see your comparisons there as far as getting this story off the, off the ground because it does kind of harken to I think I know Amanda used the madness. It does remind me a little bit of Multiverse of Madness, how we just literally cut right into that yeah. story as well as and and I don't know if you guys agree with me, but this felt like a, and I think even Peyton Reed and Paul was that they were highly inspired by Thor Ragnarok, which this film had a lot of like mirroring Thor Ragnarok. And I know Amanda, that's your, that's, that's your, uh, your film, but it reminded me so much of that from just not only the, the beats of the comedy, but also that Janet or, uh, Jatorga's character, the freedom fighter, very similar how I looked at uh, Tessa Thompson's character as Valkyrie, yeah. and just how we got into the uh, obviously going to space and the Grand Master versus Bill Murray. So there was a lot of like huh. Thor Ragnarisms <laughs> going on with me, and I love Thor Rag- Ragnarok. I know Amanda, yeah. not so much, but it, it reminded me a lot of that, especially when it comes to the pacing of it all. But again, as you alluded to, Griff, we kind of get right into things. This is where. <sighs> I don't know if this is a plot hole or maybe just some thin writing, but the idea that Hank and Hope helped her construct this quantum uh, compass machine. And, and obviously, as a man alluded to, Janet wasn't as forthcoming about why this is a big threat. But I would think even not even knowing about Kane, that you would not want to help someone in bringing in the quantum realm because it is just just from the inherent nature of the quantum realm. You don't want to yeah. play with it. I don't know if that was Amanda, your thoughts on kind of that whole plot of how they helped out. And also, too uh she's calling them grandparents i don't know when that happened when they were like so close as like hey grandpa if i'm not mistaken did she call hank grandpa at one point yeah yeah Yeah, like they they got like yeah they got really close close, real fast yeah i'm like that i guess that's fine but i i kind of agree elliot because obviously hank knows about the quantum realm is like he's he knows what's in there you know what i mean like i'm pretty sure they've had conversations with with janet before she got stuck in there you know so yeah 
it was a bit odd because that's always like your granddaughter. I know you like I know like with grandparents, like they make you get away. You want to be with involved murder, and help them out. Like, yeah, 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 you're just yeah. they 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 want you to have fun and and yeah. help you out with that stuff. So I get that side of it, but at the same time, yeah. as a scientist. Like this is some what are you dangerous doing? Yeah. To be playing around with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So it's all I, rather like convenient for what yeah. it is. I it hate saying that because you need yeah. to have a story. So obviously there's some sure. convenience, but yeah. What about you, Griff? Did you feel like that was something I, that was just a little bit forgivable or I don't know, Hope has her new technology and has her new company that she's running. I don't know if that was maybe an outlet to get, maybe she was, yeah. I, I would almost would have preferred if she was secretly doing this without anyone's knowledge versus having well, no one that Hank and Hope were involved. But your thoughts? I, I think I, the way I took it was she started out like while they were gone, while the blip happened, yeah, she started right. doing research. That's yeah, when she started around. learning about stuff. So it's like, right. it's not like she's going into a conversation with them completely blind about the <clears throat> quantum realm. Like, tell me about the quantum realm. It's like, no, look, I know this, 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 and this about the quantum right. realm. So like, help me fill in the gaps. Like you're not going to prevent me either way. And so right. Hank, I think, smartly learning from his mistakes with hope and darren was like well instead of bogarting my information and like yeah, possibly allowing you to create something that's even worse i'll be forthcoming yeah. with you and share this information because he's obviously a changed person from the previous ones plus yeah, it's yeah. allowing him to kind of fill the void of or, or kind of make up for what happened between him and hope in that period of time where Janet was in the quantum realm. So like yeah. that, that whole thing kind of made sense to me. And like, given the fact that, that Hank is basically like a, a pseudo grandpa to, uh, you know, Cassie like that, yeah. that I, I get all that, that, that worked for me. I didn't really have any sort of, uh, issues for that. I mean, is it, yeah. is it like, do they kind of just blow through it a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you, it's, yeah. it's nothing like yeah. that's like super deep or anything like that. But sure. I think given where the characters are at and like the, the, the arcs they've sort of gone through and the lessons they've learned along the way, it makes a right. lot of sense to me that like Hank yeah. would be willing to share that information with Cassie, who he all, who he also recognizes has a science brain. Um, yeah. And also probably a little bit of that engineering brain, given the fact that she was able to, to develop this um yeah. contraption and yeah. like the yeah. you know her dad was an electrical engineer so she was probably kind of inspired by that and Very just true. tinkering along the way so i i don't know it was i i liked it because it showed that cassie has relationships not just with you, you know she scott, doesn't just have a relationship no, with scott not, yeah. but yeah yeah she's yeah, got you know she's, yeah it's exactly it's yeah, and exactly yeah. it, it, it oh, helps it yeah it helped make the these characters all feel like one cohesive unit Sure. Yeah. And, and to that point, too, I guess just to add more to mm -hmm. it, uh, it is one of those, I guess, mindsets of like, I would rather have my hand, as I think Natasha said, I would rather have a hand on the wheel, right? So her, him kind of navigating right. and, and overseeing her, uh, I guess, would be, I just, I just, I don't know. I just felt like, like why are you guys, maybe start something smaller, <laughs> <laughs> not something so directly linked to the quantum realm. It's because phase five. We, we can't, you can't do anything very, small. <laughs> very true, very true. But as we see, this does malfunction. And we, as Amanda alluded to, we just jump right into things and we get split up in two different groups with Scott and Cassie as they go on their journey, which I think, as Griff alluded to, is kind of their their journey of not only making it out in the quantum realm, but also kind of regaining their relationship and their bond and whatnot, as you know, the same could be said about, well, actually, I don't want to say the same could be said, because I think it was kind of a weak element. Hope, hope is kind of uh, forgotten about in this particular film, which, if I'm being honest with you all, I know some people are speculating that it might have been because of her political opinions on things. I don't think that was the case, but I think so. Um, I was okay with it because it kind of narratively, narratively made sense that Janet would be more involved because this is the quantum realm. She's been here for 30 years. But I don't know, uh, Griff, starting with you, man, did you feel the absence of hope knowing that the film is titled Ant-Man and the Wasp? And I don't know, do you feel like uh, the Wasp was kind of forgotten about? Well, no, because Janet and Hope are the Wasp. So really, uh, I mean, you know, they're 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 both there. just as like you know both uh scott and hank are, hank, are yeah. ant man both and i feel like they're -Man, you know yeah. both equally in there um i mean also it just like you already have the title ant man and the wasp you're not gonna just like strike the Take wasp out. out of it just to you know because oh she's not in it yeah. as much right, i think right. she doesn't she's not as heavily in well i say that but i think she is like she's not given as many like lines but i still sure. feel like 
she's prominently there and she still plays a part in like the larger uh sort of things going on there i, I mean i think yeah. a, for a lot of the film it's kind of exploring uh, hank and janet's relationship a little bit and like some of the mistakes they made some of the things they wish that able to redo or had done and i think you see through scott and hope how they're able to get that second chance which is ultimately ultimately one of the core themes of these movies is just like giving people second chances to be better um mm. which is I, I and also that seems to be the core thing of just like ant-man as a hero he is there to give other people second mm. chances and i right, think that's right, echoed right. throughout this film as well and so mm-hmm. i guess seeing how the original ant-man and the wasp were some of the mm. mistakes they made some of the sacrifices they had to make and then seeing how that translates into scott and hope and like some of the sacrifices they make in order for cassie to then you know go on and have you know take that chance and run with it like i i dug that and i, and I also mm. think you know there is obviously some uh i don't want to say friction but there's there's a little bit of a Uh, a barrier between hope and janet that granted it's not like explored you know to the fullest but i think they do enough to sort of uh explain the fact that like janet was so driven by love for hope um Mm -hmm. until she learned that like doing that would you know kill trillions of people and then she had to make a sacrifice and so you see like hope kind of having to come to terms with a lot of that in in the film mm-hmm. I, you know not like obviously she's not giving the most screen time or necessarily yeah. the most lines of dialogue but i think the yeah. stuff she does have worked for she's me the present um yeah so i, I wasn't yeah. too like i wasn't like oh wow this the, yeah. the wasp was missing from was this it, yeah yeah it, it felt like a, a fold sort of just like you know family and like she took center stage in the last film so she's sure. you know, a little bit on the back burner now in order to make way for janet which makes sense yeah Good points, good points. And I guess for you, Amanda, if you felt the same, or I don't know uh, if it, if it would have maybe would have worked narratively speaking, if it was kind of to the pseudo relationship of Scott and Cassie, and then we have you know Hank and Hope, and then maybe Janet gets tossed somewhere else in the quantum realm as she's trying to find them. I don't know if that would have built more of that relationship, or just having I don't know Hope and Janet be on this kind of journey while Hank maybe didn't go to the quantum realm. Maybe Hank's on earth trying to help them out. So I don't know if it took away from that. Cause I do feel like to Griff's point, I do feel like it was a missed opportunity to not explore that idea of you were absent from my life. So, so long uh, mom and you chose work over me. Ma. I wish there was some more of that dynamic that we could have seen in that film. Cause I think it is very similar to Scott doing the heist and ending up in jail and missing his daughter's life for a certain amount of time. So I don't know, Amanda, did you feel Hope's absence was a detriment to the film or were you okay with less of that character development in replacement of Janet being more of the, the focal leader in this particular narrative? I, I didn't mind it. I think I agree with a lot of what uh, Griff said. I think for, for the Wasp, it was all very reactionary um, in mm. this film and that was fine. Um, I, I personally think Michael Douglas didn't really do much in this movie. Just hanging around. I think, My man was just I there he, taking like, pictures. He, like, <laughs> he took a back seat. He took a back seat. Um, I personally think um, uh, until the third act. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I think that we do have more of like a Hope and Janet vibe Dynamic because Hank was just chilling, listening to what was My happening man. in the quantum chilling. realm. Uh, yeah. you know so i think i think it worked for what it was sure which is a sure. lot i i feel like i've been making i've been saying that for a lot of phase four and i'm saying it with phase five it's like quantumania as a whole works for what it is you know a lot of these movies just the way that they make them it's like this is how it had to be done for every moving part to be pushed forward and to like yeah. tie loose ends together um but yeah, I didn't mind it. I think that Janet had to be front and center considering she had all this information yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. she did not disclose for whatever reason. Oh my gosh. Um, and like, like, I, I get you can be fearful and like Griff said, the trauma, but at some point, when are you going to say, hey guys, <laughs> this is the dealio. I don't know why it took so, it so long. But yeah. I, I yeah. 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 I, I, I don't, uh, I, I'm sure we'll go, go into that. I, <laughs> I think it's interesting because like on one hand it is very frustrating as a viewer because you're kind of just like 
going through this world and you're just like what the fuck is happening yeah. like all right whatever but like, right. i also think that's like it's kind of fun to just go through a world and just like not necessarily know the rules and just kind of experience it as it comes at you and i feel yeah. like that's sort of the case with the quantum realm because it's sure it is literally like just a nothing area based yeah, on time, like absolutely space, nothing so it's like all logic yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like there's there there is no logic, there's no physics, there's yeah. no whatever. It's 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 a fictional reality that just happens to be very very small. So or like, is it? Th- or is it right? So that doesn't <laughs> th- that doesn't really like bother me too much. But also like I think from Janet's point of view, Janet yeah. is doing what Hank did in that first film. Hank didn't give away any of his secrets. He like he he played That's everything true. close to the That's chest true. because he didn't trust anyone else to do it other than himself, which is why, okay. fact, you know, that's why he works with ants because he can control the yeah, ants and whatever. And better, so yeah. I think what I really liked about that is it showed why Janet and Hank um, were so close, why they they mm-hmm. trusted each other so much because they were almost one in the yeah. same. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so like seeing <clears throat> Janet have to realize that she needs to open up and explain stuff. Otherwise it's going to be a lot worse for everyone else. Sure. That was really compelling sure. to me. And I know it's something that a lot of people are going to struggle with and it's frustrating. And yeah, it can be frustrating as a viewer to just watch a character like passively go by and not really like say anything, but any of there, the stuff. That yeah. Happened, yeah. But it's also like, I, I like there is real narrative like intent behind it that I just, I found that like really compelling to, to just see like that in a character. It strengthened that relationship between Hank and Janet even more so. Guys, if Griffin wasn't such a great content creator, he can be a you know defense lawyer. He he definitely. Is, uh, <laughs> it's in his true. Case. I will like, say this, I, Dude, I, I, I hear what you're saying, man, and and I understand narratively. <laughs> even too to the point that she's been isolated for 30 years too. She's probably yeah, so used to yeah. keeping things to the chest, and it is probably hard to communicate at this point of her life. But I will. You did mention something about the quantum realm and kind of the nothingness of it and the logic of it. I will admit, and this is just me being a sci-fi lover and just learning, loving world building. I feel like the film did kind of forget about the rules that it did create about the quantum realm. Number one, Janet somehow had powers in the second one that was nowhere <laughs> yeah. to be found in this film. And also the no, idea no, no, of- No, 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 Wait, 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 did wait, Did she use wait. her powers? She did. She used it to wait. open up a door. She literally, she did. Oh, she, we'll she get used to that. To open up a she door. Just magically, <laughs> she's more intelligent than Kang all of a sudden and can open up portals. Oh, that uh, part, yes. We'll get to that. Yeah, we'll definitely get to that. <laughs> but to the logic of the quantum realm, Amanda, there was, and I'm just curious if you felt like it was some, maybe some lack of world building or explanation of certain things. But also, I remember our boy Scott being trapped in the quantum realm for five hours and it came out five years later. I don't know. And again, time and space works differently, but I don't know. Was it just me? Am I being a stickler? Are we nitpicking? Did that bother you at all that the quantum realm wasn't truly explored as much as the title might allude to? It was almost like the multiverse of madness. Where was the madness? I would literally took the words right out of my mouth. So I was going to mention multiverse of madness. These guidelines that they create, Ever since I watched that movie, thrown out the window. Yeah, I'm just like, put, you just know put what? Numbers I'm just, gonna, films, Marvel. Forget just put it. three, four. <laughs> don't put any more subtitles that don't allude to the story. Between, no, go ahead. That's it. Well, yeah, sorry, ahead. I was just going to say, between this yeah. Multiverse of Madness and Loki, I feel yeah. like they're repeating and changing the rules all over the place. Yeah. It's just, yes. Which is I, so I just, confusing. But that's kind of why I'm like, I, I just roll with it at this point. I'm just like, okay, Quantumania, fuck it. Like, well, uh, sure, let's do this. It's completely different multiverse sort of bullshit. Yeah. I just... Sure. You know, you would I'm not saying it's a good thing. Fighting, I'm just saying in the case of this. Writer's room, yeah. Michael Walden's dealing with Loki, Multiverse of Madness, and Secret Wars. You have Jeff uh, Loveless who's dealing with this one. He's going to be writing the Kane Dynasty. Where is the cohesiveness, Amanda? Dude, Go Rick ahead. and Morty, <laughs> they got to get their shit together. I think we're going to actually have to see Rick and Morty in the MCU <laughs> in order for all of this to come together. It's going to yeah. have like, to happen. But it's how did you feel wild. about it, Amanda, about this kind of the, again, is it just nitpicking? Did it bother you at all that it was just certain things that were maybe forgotten about from the previous establishment of the quantum main? And what was it like you said with Griff? It was just like, all right, I'm just here for the ride. I'm here for the ride, man. <laughs> like, if we are the 30th film, I don't know. 31st the 30th film, film in the franchise, yeah. 31st yeah. film in the franchise. It's phase five. Uh, if they yeah, want to keep no. changing the rules, let them change the rules. Guess what? We don't remember. We don't know. They keep moving yeah. the goalpost. True. Literally, by the end of this, in regards to what happened in Loki season one, do we have answers? We don't have, we have a little bit more, but we yeah. don't have answers. You know what I mean? So it's just, they keep changing things and that's things fine. Up. Like, it's fine if we're going to yeah. just go in and 
you know, I think at the end of the day, it's how much you love these characters. What happens to these characters or the world that they're in doesn't really matter anymore if it's connected <laughs> to anything else because that's just, I don't know, that's just how I'm feeling. And yeah, it's it's a go in. It's a journey. It's an experience. Yeah. Get out. Don't make these connections because the connections I feel died with Endgame. Being forgotten about. Yeah, that's it. I agree. Like, and this was, it. you know, this is yeah. a... A larger conversation we could maybe have at the end. And by the way, guys, for you all watching right now, thumbs up, share, comment, subscribe to these great content creators. Uh, I would it would mean a lot to me and as well as them. But kind of getting into, I guess, and we'll, like I said, we'll save that conversation for later. But I feel like the the continuity of Marvel, they're so gun ho on like what's next, what's next. They sometimes forget about the present, you know, stuff that's at hand. But again, moving on to this to the rest of the story, we're now pivoting into the second half of the film, and I guess we can collectively say that. The first half was was fine, a little bit rough at points, but it was you know it was fine. The second half, to me, and, and starting with you, Griff, as we meet this group of freedom fighters led by Jatora, I believe her name was, which I actually kind of liked that character. It reminded me like like I said, mm -hmm. kind of Valkyrie meets Xena. She was a badass character. Didn't have a lot of development, but you understood what she was fighting for to an extent because yeah. I don't fight like the film really kind of dove into you know get into the the war that we get at the end. But we meet them. And Griffin, we are also introduced to William Jackson Harper, who a lot of us might have speculated that that might be our new Reed Richards, which obviously wasn't the case. And then we meet the weirdness with the goo character, which again reminds me so much of Thor Ragnarok, <laughs> kind of like a core goofy character, which I think was so voiced by better. David. Korg, yeah, Korg, oh, Korg fucking sucks. So I am, I, I will gladly take Thor Love and Thunder. Yeah. They should have just ended that character right <laughs> there. Uh, but Griff, we meet the weirdness of the MCU, the, the weirdness of the quantum manium. Was all that weird, goofy kind of? as you mentioned, Saturday morning cartoon, was that working for you? Or was it just like, ah, oh, this is Marvel trying to be funny and, and, and reach out to the mass <laughs> audience, get the kids, you know, buy it. Oh, mom, I want to get a, whatever that character was. Named. <laughs> ben, I think Van was, uh, was the character, but what did you think about all that stuff there and drinking the goo and all that stuff? The holes guy. Yeah. The holes um, guy. <laughs> I, that, that to me felt very Rick and Morty. That was like, like the characters the bits like even yeah. the part at the end where he gets the holes and it's kind of like calling back to that like that is like so fucking stupid and ridiculous but i i couldn't help but laugh i was just yeah and i'm not even the, like look i say this as someone who's not even the biggest rick and morty fan but i yeah, I've only seen was, episodes, you know but yeah i i dug i dug what they were doing in there and it was like I got weird it's, I got it. Yeah. it was really funny because when i saw the initial reactions and everyone's like it's weird i'm like mm -hmm. okay is it really weird or are you just saying it's weird because it's like, you know, whatever, but yeah, no, they yeah. actually do kind of take it in some very interesting and bizarre places. I mean, obviously we'll, we'll Star we'll Wars territory, right? That's a lot of people just keep so, wearing Star I, Wars. Yeah. I, I saw the, I saw the Star Wars thing and I think there's, there's elements that reminded me of, of the prequels specifically. Um, yeah. Like, like, yeah. you know, the, the Coruscant looking place, the shot right. of like Kang looking at the legions, which is like very attack yeah. of the clones. Yeah. Um, I think, bar, yeah, the, the yeah. cantina bar. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, so I, I see where people get that to, to me, it actually reminded me a lot of uh, John Carter uh, which I guess is actually yeah, like that was kind of like the precursor to Star Wars in in yeah. you know like yeah. yeah. like that was literature and then you know Star Wars kind of like took from that and doing and like Good you know call. a bunch of other yeah. stuff but yeah that there was a, there was a lot of uh, Star Trek in there like Star Trek Beyond with like the pairings and like the different sort of like storylines going on uh, yeah. there was like Tron Legacy vibes I was getting from like you know <laughs> Kang wanting to get out and um, there was like like. Inspiration. Like Indiana Jones, yeah, inspiration, yeah, yeah. Whole, yeah, 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 yeah. Big, big sci-fi. Like this to me was like Peyton Reed's love letter to just like all the science fiction that that he loves yeah, and that he is a fan yeah. of. Because yeah. there's like so many, like, like, dude, this is how. <laughs> and maybe I'm like the only one who noticed this, but when uh, after Hank and Janet sort of like reveal that they've like you know been having sex with other That's people for thirty lovers. years, which by yeah, the yeah. way. Great moment. Love that. Very, very down for that. <laughs> Linda didn't um, work out with her. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. And yeah. he was like, there, there's only you, baby. I was like, that is the exact line from Kingdom of the Crystal Skull that Indy <laughs> says to Marion when they're That's in the right. fucking truck. It's 
Wait, is oh, this Jadum? A Christmas yeah, Skull true. reference. I never would have thought yeah, I would yeah. have yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's that, and then like pouring the goo into the mouth was very Temple of Doom, like the blood of the Kali. So, like, yeah, look, good call. I'm like going all over the place, but like there were so many just like references to other pieces of sci fi yeah. that, yeah. I, yeah. you know, they're pretty blatant knockoffs, but sure. I, and, and perhaps they were a bit too overt, but I kind of just loved the reverence for it regardless like it just, i think peyton reed just kind of like put his heart out there and was like yeah i love this stuff why not let's yeah. just go for it and i'm like all right cool i'm down i hear you man hey i appreciate the enthusiasm and, and a man uh, amanda tossing to you on that element of that particular story with cassie and scott meeting that particular group of people and their you know their whole mission and where they're coming from kane took everything from them and where that stems from yeah. And I guess paralleling that to what's going on with Hope, Janet, and Hank as they're meeting Bill Murray, you know, who I thought was a character that might have been a little bit more involved, but it was just more or less a glorified cameo. Said He reminded me so much of the Grandmaster, just like his the way, yeah. uh, and I don't think he like architects himself after that, but I feel like they have some similarities. But which, and, yeah. and this is the second half of the film. Like I said, it kind of takes a detour from, um, you know, we're, we're trying to establish the world and trying to establish the weirdness and like Griff alluded to, the homages to some of the science fiction films we love how'd you feel about that portion of the film i feel like they needed to fill time with something because <laughs> jonathan majors wasn't gonna show up halfway through this film fam like i think yeah. that's what it felt like it yeah. was fun don't get me wrong i had it i was more entertained um <clears throat> with scott and cassie in that entire journey that and i think that you line. had yeah. to see yeah i was more entertained by that because it was new it was different these creatures like yeah as much as like the vfx felt a bit unpolished at times and the cgi wasn't the greatest i yeah. still think creatively the creatures that they they made for that entire section with scott and cassie i thought that it was it was a lot of fun they're like sure yeah. they're weird like the broccoli dude i was like that, <laughs> why does that exist um but it was just it was entertaining for that reason but you also got to see two different sets of people kind of introduce Kang with a different perspective. Yeah, so we're hearing yeah. it from the side of like Janet and, uh, you know, and Bill Murray's character and them. Mm -hmm. And then like what happened with her slow, slowly revealing <laughs> what was <laughs> happening. And then you had, yeah. you know, um, you know, that, that group of people see it from a different lens. And I, I think yeah. it worked again. It worked for what it was. I wasn't a fan of like the <clears throat> editing of this film. And like, I felt the pacing was a bit off at times, but I, I think showing it from different perspective to finally yeah. get to King uh, was yeah. yep. beneficial, but it's still mm. like a little bit had to fill it with some, what are you gonna, what's in the quantum realm? You have to fill it with something. So they had to fill it with weird <laughs> creature people and have yeah. fun, you know? So Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird because it's like for as big as this movie is, as monumental, like, you know, for going forward as it is for yep. the MCU, it did feel small. And and I'm a I'm kind of of two minds where it's like, I like that because that's what I liked about the Ant-Man movies was just, yeah. yeah, just like the mm -hmm. small scale sort of stakes <clears throat> and whatnot. And you yeah. get a little bit of that in the first two acts. Um, but at the same time, if you're in this like vast world like i i feel like you really need to take advantage of that large canvas and kind of yeah. just like you know really texturize it and populate it and, and all that stuff and I, I like to be fair i think they did like a pretty decent job like it, it maybe this is going to sound like insane but i don't think it was any less detailed than something like the force awakens like i think the only difference is like the force awakens had practical sets and yeah, and, yeah. yeah. you know th they actually like utilize certain you know geographical parts of the world and actually labeled parts of the world so like you kind yeah, of had a sense of what was going on that, yeah yeah but yeah. like i don't I, I think when you kind of take a step back they're not going to like less places than like your average star wars movie if we're going to stick with the star True. wars analogy True. so yeah, I, yeah. You know, I, I don't I don't know. But uh, to Amanda's point, yeah, there, there was something that felt like I think they did a better job than Multiverse of Madness of kind of taking advantage of like all the, the things that, yeah. you know, this this kind of story offers you. But it did yeah. still uh, 
feel like one corner of a very large sandbox. Large universe, yeah. And yeah, yeah. To, and again, I, I totally agree with you, Griffin, on Amanda's point. I do like how you mentioned in two, two different perspectives how we get Bill Murray, someone that has cooperated and collaborated of a sense with Kang and what the benefits of what that world looks like. You live rich and you know you have somewhat of order versus the free the freedom fighters which by the way you mentioned rick and morty earlier griff was it just me and this is just where my uh immature mind goes those buildings look like yeah. dildos <laughs> <laughs> that was my first thought i was like why did they story. design like, it like this like, dude all, yeah, is this dude, disney I'm, doing 100%. the whole like throwing in like sexual references to, to, they've been doing so, that for so here's <laughs> here's what i'm gonna say this this is gonna be insane so yeah. like the I think Ant Man and the Ant Man trilogy is the yeah. most progressive thing that Disney has ever made, or at least the MCU has ever made. One, their protagonist is a criminal who From fights for you know people, yeah. is willing to go to prison, you know, participate in riots in order to do stuff that's right, and is very like you know a cab and stuff like that. So yeah. like, love that. Yeah. Um, then you have Cassie kind of following in those footsteps, very pro revolutionary, very pro, you know, upsetting the establishment. It indicts authoritarian rule. Yeah. Here's where it gets really fun. So Scott or not Scott, uh, Hank and Janet yeah. are an elderly couple and they're allowed to be sex positive. Yeah. yeah. Fuck. Yeah. yeah. Love that. Yeah. Like, let's yeah. get that. Like, they're, you know, they go off and they have, they fulfill their needs, but they come back together because they love each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah. And then my favorite part is uh, how Hank <laughs> Hank uses ants as a metaphor to be pro-socialism. And so, I was like, yes, that, that, dude, that, what? That, yeah. I did not expect that. But I'm like so fucking down for it. Like, that that's, so funny. Hey. That was incredible. Um, so, yes, having the dildo ships feels like it's in line with the Ant-Man like. ethos, you know? <laughs> Only for Ant-Man. Yeah. Only for Ant-Man. But again, <laughs> I'm fucking again, here man, for it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's this is the weird guys. This is where the weird comes from Peyton Reed's mind. And, and and then again, I do appreciate those elements. But I think for me for the second half, I think the balancing act between cutting between the two different groups did kind of slow down the pace like a man alluded to. And at some point, the ramping up and the fear factor of and we're just gonna jump right into Kang now because this is the part where he actually comes into the film, but did you guys like the setup? Was it almost too much setup of just like every time it's like he, you know, the conqueror? And then did you guys like the the setup there, Amanda? Was it was it too much? Was it too little? Did you like how they were building up to when we get actually meeting Kang? It, how can I put this? It didn't take long in the film, but because yeah. we watched Loki, I was like, let's go. Like we Bring know him who's out. here. Bring them out. We know yeah. what this is about. Like, you know what I mean? That I think that's <clears> what really we know who he is. We get yes. it. Just show him for the love of God. We are all here for him to be perfectly and, honest. And they tease the like, beginning with that great opening scene. And he's like, Where yeah. I'm like, I'm like, oh my goodness, he's already stolen the movie just in that one. Yeah. <laughs> but like I was we'll like, can can we can he yeah. like make it fast here? But like he's, for he's other great. people, like Gr Griff and I, we love Ant-Man. There's not many people that love the character, that love the family. There's not many people that I know, frankly, yeah. that it's one of their top characters. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone going to watch this movie, they don't care about Scott. They're like, show me the big baddie right now. We need to see him. Right Thank here. you. <laughs> this guy right here. Um, yeah. So I think it in the movie, they could have maybe made it a bit quicker, but yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't really mind it. We understood that they had to build it up um, so I wasn't like peeved about that. I just, I wanted to see him, you know, and we did. And I think he came in at the right time. Cause I was already yeah. like, I don't want to say checked out because I was entertained. Don't get me wrong, but I felt yeah. like there was a lull right before he came. And I'm like, thank God he showed up or else it would have been, you know, I would have graded it differently here. Well, to set the scene up, Griffin, we'll toss it to you, man. We um, Again, we have Cassie and Scott that are doing their thing. They're hearing about this, this individual group of people that's been split from their families and their homes have been destroyed and whatnot, and it's all due to one man. And this one man sends out, um, you know, as they call this particular character, their hunter, and this is going to be the fun part uh, to get into. So we, we get the reveal of this hunter, Griff, and I think we all kind of saw the trailer. We knew that this particular character was going to be involved in the film. And I think it was spoiled who the character was to a certain extent. So Griffin, I'm going to toss it to you first, man. We get the introduction of MODOK. And look, mask on, 
visually very cool menacing yeah i'm not the yeah, biggest yeah. fan of the comics because it was just a, such a secure up, obscure and weird character to begin with which this would be the perfect film to have him in but griff yeah. i'm gonna toss it to you man visually how did you think about the character how the character was used what did you think about mr modok <laughs> look at that mug the fucking thing oh I, <laughs> to give them credit i think the way that they explained why he looks the way he does was mm-hmm. actually pretty smart. The fact that they took whatever they did in that first film where he just kind of like collapses yeah, in and of himself in. Yeah. and is just yeah. becomes a head with like very small limbs like that. Yeah. That was actually a pretty creative way to bring him to life. Um, I, it's, it's really weird because it's like, I, I feel like they did the best they could with trying to adapt Modoc to live action, but mm-hmm. I also yeah. just think that there are simply some characters that are drawn like cartoons. One hundred percent. Modoc, yeah, Modoc is one of them, and so like yeah. I don't think he's necessarily a character that translates well to live action when yeah. you take it yep. literally like face in yeah. body kind of thing. Yeah. Like I, I mean, I texted like our group chat, but I was like, he looks like Humpty Dumpty from like Puss in Boots. Mm-hmm. which isn't, you know, the most pleasant thing to look at. Yeah. And so, like, yeah. when you're looking at MODOK, it's, it's like, a bit off-putting. I, and I can't even necessarily say that I got used to it. I, it was still kind of, like, uncomfortable and just a bit just, like, that's really fucking weird, and yes. I, I don't <laughs> necessarily like it. That being said, I think that they also knew that it was really it was weird, weird and uncomfortable. Yeah. So they okay. so they I limited would. the amount of time that his face was on screen and they never mm-hmm. maybe for better or worse, they never took him too seriously. They let him have yeah. his hero moments here and, yeah. here and there when he kind of, you know, is like, "My name is Darren and I'm not a dick." Like, first of all, <laughs> great fucking line. Loved that. That was that was kind of rewarding on that. And then yeah. like, you know, having Scott basically just kind of like look <laughs> like Paul yeah. Hill's reaction to, to Modoc's death was so fucking funny. I w- I loved his little just facial reactions. It was a great way of just like you know oh, Mo- yeah. like like Darren is just a pathetic character and so <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ. That's so so him funny. kind of getting to do it's haunting, that. Man. That's a haunting look. It is there. it is Halloween. he looks like uh he looks like <laughs> Grendel from the uh the Robert Zemeckis Beowulf movie, which is another <laughs> just like very another, like yeah. unsettling <laughs> like yeah. thing yeah. to look at. Yeah. I, either way, uh do I understand why people don't w- will not like the Modoc stuff? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't I, I didn't like I, I don't know. I, I didn't feel strongly about it either way. I think sure, what sure. they kind of wound up doing with the character was about as good as you were going to get. And if you're going to put him in a movie, yeah. this is probably this is the, the movie to put him in. Yeah. Yes. Um. So yeah, I, I don't know. It, yeah, it, it was. It's it's a bit. Uh, it's a bit weird. I I did like the the last thing I'll say is I did like how they kind of connected the fact that like this guy was the monster in Cassie's room and it, yes. when she was a kid and yeah. Cassie, you know, held back and was like, you know what, man, yep. I'm not going to kill you. Just stop being a dick. No, you don't have to yeah. like, and, and then also I liked how it kind of unpacked a bit of, of how Darren is just so insecure. He's just like, yeah. someone tell me what to do, please. I don't know yeah. what to do with my Lost. myself. So like that, yeah. these are all great elements. It's just, you kind of got to get past that. <laughs> the weird, just like look at the character. Yeah. Amanda, take it away. The, again, whether it's the visual of the character, the use of the character. Again, I wasn't personally a fan. Of, I think you could have literally, literally taken him out of the film entirely and then would have missed the beat. But your yeah. thoughts on this yeah. character's inclusion in the film and if it worked, if it didn't work. And is this, this is another example of Marvel kind of digging into the, the weeds of villains that are somewhat popular, uh, you know, because I know Modoc, Modoc had a show on Hulu, which I think got renewed. And it, again, it's a very obscure character that's fought many different Avengers in the comics. But yeah. Modoc, are you happy that we finally saw him? And I guess with the multiverse, this might not be the last time we see this character. But your thoughts on this uh, killing machine? It, I'm gonna have nightmares now with this yeah. picture. No, I'm joking. Uh, I feel I low key feel bad for Corey Stoll. Like, yay, he's back, but like, at what cost here? Um, you know. So, I I loved um, his exterior. 
his yeah, um, not it's his clean. face, but the, yeah. holy <laughs> lord, like his his that um, you know, off. the plates, like the mask, mm-hmm. everything that mm-hmm. he had. I'm like, this looks menacing. This is awesome. Um, but I guess they kind of had to play it up for humor to reveal the face that he had. And again, I yeah. agree with Griff. Like, if it's any movie to bring him into, it has to be this one where mm-hmm. you can mm-hmm. have every single reaction to Modoc be like, Darren, Darren, like every five yep. minutes. And which was, in, it was funny. <laughs> it was, especially with hope at the end. It was like, Darren, <laughs> like it was just so funny. Um, so it was entertaining, but I do think that Modoc needed to be in this because who else was Cassie going to fight first? Yeah. As a bad yeah. to as first. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think that it was a good, like first villain. And it makes sense because with, you know, with what Griff said is that Cassie saw him for the first time when she was a kid in his room. So yeah. I think that that also was like how to close off that chapter of her life and understand yeah. what had happened at that time. And then mm-hmm. even grow as a person, as a hero further by not actually killing him. So I think that, it's very minor. Like, like if, yeah. you know, yeah. once you think about it, it's like, oh, yeah, you know what? Like, that's her first villain. So it makes complete yeah. sense to have him in there. So I like those little moments, but it was fun. You needed, you need like a bummy character. And he was the bummy character in this yeah. movie to kind of like make those jokes and uh, yeah. have those like lame moments, you know? So I think uh, that worked out. Yeah. Also, real quick, Elliot, I mm-hmm. I think what's interesting, you know, kind of everyone's making like the Star mm-hmm. Wars kind of comparisons. I mean, like he's... He's basically like the Darth Vader to uh, Kang's Emperor, if you really want to make that kind of parallel to it. I mean, he's obviously he's a bit I mean, more yeah, pathetic. it was almost like a montage of uh, uh, Revenge of the Sith of his creation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, 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 that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, and then yeah. you kind of like Janet kind of being like the Obi Wan figure. Hey, yeah, I, you you can draw, you can make the yeah. parallels there, but I think 100%. you know when when Darth Vader takes his helmet off, I mean he's just like a pathetic old man who's just been yeah. burnt and scarred, and it's like it is sure. one of those like wow sure. this this massive killing machine is just a very sad individual, and so Broken I think person, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you look at Modok through that lens, you can kind of. <laughs> like appreciate what what they do what they do with the character yeah. it it yeah. literally yeah. just is like the vision like the image of his face yeah. just this like super impo- like you know the george lopez from uh yeah, you know shark boy and lava girl yeah. like yeah mm-hmm. so like yeah. if you're able to get past that which is a big if uh i i think you can appreciate <laughs> what they do with the character I hear you, man. And, and it might be one of those. I don't. And again, this is uh, the film as we're recording. This hasn't been out to the public, but I'm just very curious on the public reception if it's going to be taken. Oh, to me, to I took it as yeah. just like just just a, uh, the pun, the joke. And that's only the, ser- the to serve the purpose of the character was to have that dick joke and and then to tie up the Cassie stuff. But I could have went without that character. But yeah. moving to, to the to the big bad, the actual character that I think, as a man alluded to, as sad as it may be, I was here for Kang and. Jonathan goddamn majors did not disappoint on any front. So a man of just kind of backtracking, we we open the film, which, you know, very similar to the other two films. We always get these cold opens of flashbacks. The first one I think mm-hmm. was showing Hank leaving uh Shield, and the second one was the the flashback yeah. of Hope or Janet leaving and going to do the mission when she's lost. And then we get the flashback here of when she meets Kang. And again, from that opening scene, him just that look of not knowing where he is a little bit of that fear that he has but also that charm and charisma of just like you're, you want to help him he just seems like someone you want to help we get the backstory of amanda why janet was so afraid of kang you know they're helping each other out I, I'm, gl- I'm so glad they didn't take like a romantic route with them it was just a pure understanding yeah. just trying to help each other out in the situation um and they kind of you know throughout this traumatic situation they built this friendship they get his uh, multiversal engine to work after it was sabotaged by who we'll talk about the post credit scene, the other Kangs. And she touches his essentially his brain throughout the core and she sees all the conquering he's done. And Amanda, the switch from when he is being that charming collective scientist trying to just help her get to her daughter, help him go back to his mission. And when he's then when she says, you know, who are you? And he goes to the conqueror mode. Ah, Jonathan Majors is here to stay and he is killing it. Amanda, your yeah. thoughts on the handling of the backstory, the introduction of fully meeting this character, fully realized, Kane the Conqueror. Take it away. 
I loved every second of it. I think Michelle Pfeiffer and Jonathan Majors had great chemistry to actually um, bring these characters and their relationship forward. And I think I like that they started with the cold open like that. So we yeah. know who who's actually present. Like, mm -hmm. again, for those who have watched the show, like if they've watched Loki and they know oh, who yeah. he is, it just hits differently than people who don't. You know, they've never been introduced to Kang, yet they're still yeah. it's still unfolding in a way that, you know, both audiences can appreciate and really grow to, you know, find him an interesting character. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the thing with Jonathan Majors is that, like you said, he's very charming. He can literally <clears throat> talk your ear off in such like a very like he's soft spoken. Mm -hmm. You you know, he was vulnerable and you're like, yeah, of course, I'm going to help you. Of course, I'm going <laughs> to do that. The moment. Yeah. That he did the head tilt. Oh, man. I was like, he did not do that head tilt that good. Like, it's just a head tilt, but I felt it in my bones. Yeah. And then he changed, and I was like, no, I'm like, best villain in the MCU ever, like, incoming. He's going to destroy phase five. And that just made me really excited because it's just very subtle movements subtle reactions mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. expressions that he has that he barely has to say anything and i'm like that's yeah. intimidation right there that's the villain that we need in phase five and i i mm -hmm. think he absolutely crushed it because he's not in it for a long period of time. I, I wouldn't be amazed and i'm sure someone will calculate calculate it online 15 20 minutes max if that yeah yeah and he yeah. stole it and you felt his presence throughout from that cold open so that's exactly. what's like so amazing about it well said, Amanda. And, and tossing to you, Griff, as far as, again, his backstory, the origin of his relationship with Janet, him trying to get back to his fixed timeline, him having the discovery of his ship being sabotaged by the other King variants, and just the performance of Jonathan Majors there, as well as kind of transitioning to the conversation he has with Scott, which even though we've seen that clip a thousand times already at this point with the trailer, but it still felt weighty. Like Amanda said, all his words had weight to it. It was... Mm -hmm. Thank God Marvel didn't throw any jokes towards Kang. It was just all serious business. And again, yeah. the way he spoke was just so meticulous. Like it wasn't rushed. It wasn't slowed. It was just because he's the master of time. Griff, what did you think about Kang and his portrayal in this film? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard not to walk out of this movie and not say that like Jonathan Majors is the MVP. I, yeah. I think the only <clears throat> thing I will say is that sometimes the film felt at odds with majors and what he was doing like it felt like the ant-man crew was going on this wacky quantum realm adventure with like broccoli aliens and shit yeah. like that and it's like and that's really cool i'm, I'm yeah. like totally down for that but then mm -hmm. uh when majors came in like like even just like interactions that that would be within like a same scene like the way that he would talk to someone is very true to how kang would talk to someone yeah but then yeah. like the whole the conversation would just feel weird. It would feel like he was playing it one way, someone else was playing it like yeah. they're in this movie. So like uh, for yeah. as great for as great as Jonathan Majors is, it felt like he was like his performance was designed for a completely different film. And I, I, I that's not necessarily like yeah. no, a bad or from. good thing. Yeah. But mm -hmm. it, it yeah. is just like one of those things that were uh, it did kind of add to like the, the weird disconnect between tones going on here, which I actually have to say the movie goes through a lot of different tones. And I think yeah, for the most yeah. part, it is able to flip flop between them like decently. Well, it's not the cleanest thing, but mm -hmm. where I noticed it the most was, you know, majors interacting with Modoc or like majors interacting yeah. with, with Scott or, yeah. or, or whoever. Um, yeah. And so that was a bit weird. As for like, uh, you know, Kang as as a character and like his stuff with Janet, that stuff was really cool because um, I think through those conversations with Janet, we we learned that like the reason Kang is a conqueror is because uh, of of his family. So he's like a really interesting kind of contrast to this family unit that is the the Ant Fam or or wherever. You know, he was he was cast aside by all of his other clones uh, because he didn't agree with what they were doing. And now he's basically coming back even worse because uh, they've messed up the timeline. He's like, I have to be the only one to do this, mm -hmm. which is also very interesting because 
he is is suffering from like a similar thing that like Janet and Hank are suffering from suffered mm. from, which is that he feels he has to be the only one at control because he is the like no one else is able to fix the problems. He has to mm-hmm. basically wipe the timeline clean. He has to conquer. He has to oppress because he has no faith in anyone else other than himself. Uh, which I I like I understand why they selected you know after seeing this movie like I understand why they selected the Ant Man the- franchise. Yeah to mm-hmm. use him as the villain because he's a great yeah. counterpoint to uh their collaborative efforts i mean just yeah. just down yeah. to the fact that like he is a conqueror that is the yeah. exact opposite of how the ant family functions they i mean yeah. they function like ants who all work together work to create together. something mm-hmm. greater than themselves um yeah i mean you know hank has the the socialism metaphor which is funny but also mm-hmm. it kind of speaks to the difference of ideologies between someone who's very, uh, you know, extremist, authoritarian, and then someone who is like on the, you know, a group of people who are on the other side, who is more for just like freedom and, uh, and, and collaboration and, and, you know, all that stuff. So like that, that to me was, was very compelling. And I think uh, majors did a great job of being chilling, of being formidable of, of, you know, the fact that we don't see him until halfway through the film and Mm -hmm. you felt his presence all the way through, like that's, I mean, you know, you got to give it up to Peyton Reed and the writers for like creating this very large shadow uh, that, you know, uh, or just not a shadow, but I guess creating this this feeling of of, of dread. Like there was something right, yeah. out there, you yeah. someone pulling yeah. the strings, and yeah. uh, that's that's not always easy to pull off. So I think I think they yeah. did a good job with that, and Majors definitely played right into it, even though there were some you know disconnects between interactions. Yeah couple things there number one i totally agree with you as far as like why kang and and ant-man because that was one of my biggest fears was like it's such a and again no disrespect to ant-man but it's just such a uh, he says you're out of your league like this is literally a a thanos level threat character that i couldn't imagine kang or scott having a conversation with thanos um but and that's where i do agree with your tonal issues it was almost as if just like this is like a, a this Greek god talking to this human being, and it's just it is, and, and knowing Ant Man and knowing Paul Rudd and Scott Lang, it, it did kind of feel a little bit off uh, at yeah. points. My biggest issue with the way, and this isn't a Jonathan Majors issue, is it's, a, it's just my issue with Marvel in general, the power scaling. I feel like Kang had to be somewhat dumbed down or powered down in order to fit within the Ant Man world, because um, in reality, I think Kang will be able to handle them with ease. But there were some moments they kind of forgot who Kang was, in my opinion. But again, I think Jonathan Majors just completely uh, distills the show and really brings a lot to the table. And again, we'll get to the ending, but I just can't wait to meet these other variants, these other versions of the character. But, you know, moving along as far as as we get after after the second half establishes what the mission is, which is we have to get this multiversal engine that was destroyed by Janet, which has been affected by the pin particles. We have to go into this probability storm and we get the weird scene of all the different Ant-Mans. I don't know if the, the Baskin Robbins joke were for you all. The one Baskin Robbins. Oh, it was version. great. I, I loved it. it. I fucking love that scene, man. That, Same. That, no, that was cool. the, what was That's, it called? Yeah. The probability storm. Probability yeah. storm was great. Yeah, yeah it was a pretty it. interesting visual yeah. uh, uh, elements of the film. He mm-hmm. eventually gets the, the the engine with the help of Hope, because at this point they all collaborate. But unfortunately, you can't trust Kang. You know, he doesn't hold up his end to the bargain. He betrays them, and he takes the engine on his own. And this is where our team has to gather the freedom, the freedom fighters. Hank's ants have been in the quantum realm for, I guess, a thousand years, and they've kind of perfected their own technology and how to, you know, come up with things. And I don't know, this is kind of where an issue falls with me. And, and starting with you, Amanda, the third act has felt a little bit too too much for me if i'm being honest and, and a lot of stuff wasn't as established as i would have wanted to especially from the f- freedom fighters perspective that to me just kind of was thrown in last minute and it felt so small too like this this war of kang's minions who were kind of lackluster in my opinion mashing in with that there's the mcu jokes i, got, I know you mentioned the uh, Modoc and the and the whole conversation between him and, and uh, Ant Man that to me just kind of took me out of the seriousness of the scene. Like to me, the yeah. perfect example of having a joke in the middle of like catastrophic war is Captain America. I'm Groot. That scene to me worked because it came with you know the characters and development and fit, as well as Thor and Captain America. You know, you take the big one, you take the little one. Like little stuff like that to, to me worked. But the, it took mm-hmm. me so out of the scene when they're having Modoc the five minute 
almost robbed me a Deadpool too, and he just couldn't die. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't the biggest fan of the handling of that third act. I don't know, Amanda. Do you share any of those sentiments, or do you feel like they stuck the landing on bringing all the pieces to the puzzle of the Freedom Fighters and Kang and Cassie being safe? She becomes stature. What do you think about the third act? I feel like all third acts in CBMs have yeah. massive issues. They no one knows how to end a movie because there could have been three different endings for yeah. quantum media. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> like that's the only issue. I think every single CBM, like it's the same type of structure as we know. Um, but Except for Civil War it has a great third act, and I love it. Yeah, that's true. As I much as Civil I have War my that. my peeves with that movie, um, Captain <laughs> Captain Tony is good. I'll give you. Yeah, idea. that's yeah. that's a that's a great one. It's true. Um, I love the probability storm, and and the reason why <laughs> I love the probability storm is first it goes back to the roots of who Ant Man is. The whole point is what you know Hank also does with the ants. They have to think as one. They think together, and the one thought that they have is to save Cassie. And I thought again, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's going mm -hmm. back to the first film. What does Scott care about more than anything? And then he creates this community within himself i know that sounds really weird but it's like he believes in himself and he believes in his daughter and that gets him up so i think that the the way that peyton reed visually handled that just made me really happy because mm -hmm. that's those are my favorite things from the first ant man the second one is the fact that you could play with these sizes you could play with these like wacky concepts because of this character and i'm like there it is like mm -hmm. that's that's what I missed from the first half of this film, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, so that made me really happy. I think having the freedom fighters come in again, that's out of convenience because Kang has this massive army, which he Empire, barely yeah. used. He didn't. Yeah. He barely he used wanna, it. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, so yeah. <laughs> then you have the ants taking him over, which was fun because I think again, like that whole thing with Hank is like the whole time Michael Douglas was checked out. You're just talking to his aunt's family. It's all he was doing, and that's fine. So, yeah. yeah. So he had, like, the I, the hero moment, you know, it, with that. But at the same time, like you said, Elliot, Kang is very powerful. So either we got, like, a, like you know, his power set isn't, like, the same for this variant, and then there's going to be, like, other variants of Kang that are much stronger than this mm. variant. I don't know. But I just feel like it was all conveniently placed to have them win at the end yeah. because that's mm -hmm. what had to happen that's what has to happen for right? Scott like, I was prepared for my boy to die you saw all hey, my I think tweets we all had heat. to <laughs> RIP Ant-Man shirts printed a month before the film came out I think we were yeah, all I'm like he ain't making it and then it just what it did yeah happen. I was just very shocked I was very shocked I personally thought that they were gonna switch out Wasp and like Wasp is gone. So I thought when Solo was going to be a goner. When that, yeah. when that happened, I was like, oh, so they're just going to trade places. I literally said mm -hmm. that in the theater, and then that just didn't end up happening. So, like yeah. I said, it could have ended multiple times. They dragged out that like third act, like that that um, that final battle, as they always mm -hmm. do. But I just, yeah, it was too much happening. The one thing that I can say is the probability storm made me really happy, and Pretty then the cool. ants made me happy. So. Yeah. yeah, this is the Shang-Chi effect where I think it could have been a lot more personal, you know, uh, Wen yeah. Wu versus Shang-Chi and his daughter versus the dragons and the light show and the visuals, which, you know, like you mentioned, Amanda, is always that third act issue. But tossing it to you, Griff, I think, again, going back to what you mentioned on the handling of Kang. And again, I feel like they kind of you got to dumb down the character just to kind of play on this playing field, because in my mind, they have established that Kang is a conqueror and they established in the film that he's fought the Avengers as a Thor. So I was just so confused that he wasn't able to handle Ant-Man and, and any of his variant multiverses that he's traveled to, and as well as the idea that he couldn't figure out how to escape the quantum realm after being so intelligent, after having his timeshare. Just a lot of stuff just kind of was, like Amanda said, kind of convenient to just kind of make it a satisfying conclusion for our heroes because it is okay, and this is why I love DC okay for our heroes to lose sometimes right um but yeah. Griff, what did you think about this closing with kang being overtaken by the ants he's coming back going toe-to-toe -to -toe with ant-man on a physical level which is kind of baffling to me as well but <laughs> what did you think about all of that stuff my friend well when, when you think about kang you know the fact that <clears throat> he is a conqueror and, and what is yes. a conqueror but just like another version of a bully and what do bullies do they beat down on small people on you mm -hmm. know people who are 
less capable or, or I guess, you know, struggling. But what happens when those people band together and they try to overthrow a ruler? I think you get mm-hmm. what happens in this film because um, what Scott and the Ant fam are kind of doing is they're they're looking at each person. Uh, they're, they're looking at the small things like the, the, the little details, the relationships, the people that matter, that make a difference. And, mm-hmm. you know, with all of that, they're able to bring together the revolutionaries themselves, even turn Modoc, bring everyone together to top to topple, uh, you know, a dictator who was he's only looking at things from like a very, you know, top down level, a very broad sense. Yeah. So when you get to Kang, you know, fighting everyone. I mean, yeah, like, like, look, we get to see his his full powers. He's literally like yeah. disintegrating people True. left yeah, and right. Left he gets away. down mm-hmm. there. He's like, mm-hmm. I'll do it myself. But then he gets toppled by all of these these things kind of coming at him because he can't mm-hmm. hold it all. He, he can't do it himself. And I think that yeah. is ultimately what this film is trying to to point towards, which is that like that's the whole reason the Council of the Kangs thing exists. Yeah. It shows yeah. that like Kang the Conqueror, for as powerful as he is, cannot do it do it alone. I mean, it's the same thing yeah. with Thanos. For as powerful as Thanos was, his downfall was the fact that he basically did it alone, and and it took like all of the yeah. Avengers coming together to stop them. And so, mm-hmm. what's interesting now is that now that this Kang has experienced defeat, mm-hmm. and we've got the Council of Kangs who are like, all right. We all got to kind of come together. They all have to rally yeah. now to fight whoever the hell the team of, of Avengers is going to be going forward. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I I don't think they dumbed him down I, or, or they nerfed his powers or anything like that. We still got a sense of how strong of a character strong, he yeah. is yeah. because just imagine like a legion of them. Like they'd be they'd be unstoppable, which, you know, we're going to assume they're they're basically That's going to be going. until yeah, some, something Dynasty. happens. Yeah. 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 Um, so. And I, and I liked that the final battle between Scott and Kang, uh, you know, Kang didn't have his abilities. He his, his, his was thing was like, point. yeah, yeah he was too he is a, he was at the end of the day, for people that don't know, Kang is a human. Uh, you know, he yeah. does have this technology yeah. to his event, but he is a human being. He is a, a man at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So when you get the fact, when you get just like Kang as a person versus Scott as a person and like yeah. yes Kang is obviously a better fighter than Scott and you see Scott get yeah. beat down uh like literally Scott needs the help of hope in order yeah. to stop Kang yeah. and I think that's mm-hmm. just really I I liked that kind of dynamic and so I th- yeah you're going to get a lot of people who walk out and they're like they really nerfed Kang's powers in order to fit the narrative but mm-hmm. I, I guess I I don't know for me I I I saw it as um like thematically as just like you, you're uplifting the little guys you're banding together in order to topple the dictator yeah. and then when you get him down when you take away his powers and you get him down to your level he's just like you and me so we're gonna yeah. just like fight him like yeah. one of us so yeah, i'm telling you know. man lawyer and then uh <laughs> lawyer guys look, and, I, look it, it, here's this here's the crazy thing i I'm, I'm not even like saying like i love the movie but like yeah, I, definitely, I, <laughs> I do i do enjoy it and, and both have you know, talked I, about the things yeah. you enjoyed and didn't enjoy and, and i agree with you on that moment i just think because i do know in the last i was never a kang expert i always you know saw the characters in various different very uh mediums from comics or even in the uh, the mighty avengers and different episodes that he popped in yeah. but i was never a huge fan but as we were ramping up to the film i really did like a really deep dive into kang and i really became such a big fan of his yeah where he's coming from and i think not to get too far ahead but i think the whole idea of what kang fights for and when we get the reveal of you know his love he's his weakness is love and i think they've established that in loki with a particular character that i'm excited to see what comes with that with rorona but i think my biggest issue griff with that final scene is that the film again it's the rules of the film they had established that this is the baddest version of kang because he was so bad he had to be exiled so to me it's just like the fact that yeah. ant-man managed to defeat him this and to your point i know we're gonna get more of the kings but it's just like man is he that menacing then if ant-man managed to f- to defeat the baddest version of them that they they literally had to exile this particular king because he was just so out of order he just didn't fit in the in, in their particular plan so i don't know well, it, you it say- is rubbed me a little bit of the wrong way that they were able to yeah defeat. but would you, would you say that he actually defeated him or that he kind of bought them time because that's really true. what it's happens not, yeah, is like we you don't know, know Kang, yeah 
I mean, Kang would have, like, like, let's be real. Had Hope not intervened, Kang would have probably killed Scott, and that would have been the end of it. He would have left and gone home. Also, that's the other thing. I don't think Kang's priority in this film was fighting the people trying to, you know, revolt against him. He was trying to get away. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, like he was, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, his whole thing was like he was trying to get away so that he could go on and like continue his destiny and finish out his mission and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think that is still the case with Scott, but he just literally has a person who is fighting him in his way. And then right, Scott right. just basically gets him to a point where like, you know, he he shrinks the thing and he pisses him off and, and then yeah. is able to like get him into the. So I, I don't know. It, I don't think it was necessarily Scott beating Kang, but it was kind of setting Kang back a little bit. And then yeah. Scott and Hope yeah. were able to get out before anything else sort of happened. Yeah. <sighs> Good point. Amanda, do you have anything <laughs> to add to this to the final finale before we get into our post credit scenes? Because I will say another thing. I was also under the impression that and this is, you know, when expectations don't meet the expectations of what you think of the film. I was under the impression that, again, when they came out of the quantum realm, we were going to be jumping ahead in time, potentially. And by the time we mm. come out of this film, mm. I don't yeah. know, Prince T'Challa now is, is the king of Wakanda <laughs> and we're in 2042 or some shit. But that didn't happen. So what did you think yeah. about the ending of it all? And again, I can't. And I know Griff said that this was hope or Janet's powers, because I'm like, how the hell does she hotwire? the the engine and open up the portal and and i thought also that the device was destroyed when they got into the quantum realm so how was it able to operate i don't know it just go with it it, it, it happened it? yeah just go with it at this <laughs> point I, I, like, <laughs> it's magic just go yeah. with it at this point um i i feel like because ant-man is like he's looked at as like the fun underappreciated character because right, like right. from what you said Elliot you're like how the hell is Ant-Man going to take down like Kang or like stop Kang and stuff like that and, and it's just it's that kind of like um thought process that you wouldn't have even have thought that he could kind of like put him off with the tactics that he would use at his like you know disposal like his hero you know that Ant-Man had like that he is right so I think that that's also the issue with this movie too, is that no one expects Ant-Man to like beat Kang. No one would yeah, do that. And then when that. he does, just like yeah. you're disappointed, and it's like, but he's a hero. So like, why aren't like why would you be disappointed that he would stop him? Type of thing. You know what I mean? Whereas like, if it was Captain America or Thor battling Kang and they kind of like defeated him, I feel like people would be like, oh, okay, cool, yeah, that's believable. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think just because that it it is the little guy, yeah. it is Ant Man yeah. with all of his ants Not and all of ants. this, like yeah. yeah. So I think that that that's uh, that's what's been not bothering me, but I think that that's yeah. an issue too with the character of Scott um, in that case. But yeah, yeah, I think he's even underrated. The he's underrated yeah, he's at every single is. turn. Yeah, he is, and yeah. I. I think that's why I hope that people walk out of Quantum Mania like you know what Scott Lang's a badass. You know, like I feel like oh, I yeah. want this to happen the same way that people walked out of the Winter Soldier and said, "Holy shit, Steve Rogers is actually pretty cool as Captain America." Because no one cared in the Avengers because he was a you know the good old boy type of thing. No one cared mm -hmm. about the first Avenger. No one cared about the Avengers really uh, when he was in that. No, I meant like when he was in that. So it's just oh, like. No, okay. Yeah, 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 like no one cared about him in that. He wasn't cool because he was old fashioned. And then the Winter yeah. Soldier changed that. So I'm hoping that with the whole Ant Fam, that Quantum Mania kind of changes how people perceive Whew. these characters because yeah. they have a lot of tricks up their sleeve. They do. To I'll give them make, that. You know, to kind of put Kang at ease and lock him up the way that they did. Which is Listen. kind of not a good thing as we get into the post credit scene. Wait, so let's be real. Let's yeah. be real here. I think we've already established that Ant Man is the strongest Avenger because of all of those theories about him shrinking and going up Thanos' ass. Like, come on. Like, this has already been in the works now. We already like we've already accepted that Ant Man is that guy. So yeah. Yeah. All right, Griff. I, like I hear you, man. Yes. Um, but <laughs> wrapping up the film here, we we get our first. So again, we end the film with Scott, and I, and I do think it was kind of funny how he's walking down the street, you know, very similar to the beginning of the film, and he's like, "Wait a minute, 
did I just destroy this world? Did I just kill everyone in this world? Because as Kang warned him, if I don't stop what's coming, which is me, all of existence will no longer be. So that was a kind of an interesting kind of a, I guess, very anonymous type of ending of a sorts because he is just kind of leaving it up to there, which before we get into the post credit scenes with first with you, Griff, the ramifications of him not very similar to Janet, not telling anyone what he discovered or at least just bringing it up to the table. Will it bite him in the ass or do we eventually see Ant-Man telling the family Cassie brings together the young Avengers or will he keep this to his chest and it's going to be kind of a detriment to not having the Avengers or the Ant-Man family knowing about what he just learned. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I did like the, the ending stuff. I, I think, yeah, it was kind of funny. He was having the, just like the spiraling sort of questions, yeah. which this, that was like one of the things It's like, I can see that being the end of like this Ant-Man story and then them never like going on with it. Like it, it's kind of oh, has like the dual that. meanings. Oh my goodness. I, would I, see, I don't know. I would kind of, I would kind of dig it because it's very like, it is it is very Scott to just sort of like spiral like that and be like, holy shit, did I just doom everyone and everything to like an, like death and it, like all yeah you know, whatever, um and then you kind of get to the end with Cassie's birthday and everything and yeah, yeah I mean it's it, it it feels like very in line with the character and he's like he saved the day but did he really save the day? He's just sort yeah. of like questioning it because he's having this whole like existential crisis the whole movie and so. Like that, yeah, like like that fits. But also, it, it it very clearly is pointing towards the rest of stuff, yeah, to yep. come. Um, I think if I had to say something, like I I'd rather, I would have rather them not overtly kind of say like, oh my god, is ever is he really dead? Is this all all this stuff going to happen? And then just wait for the post credit scene to kind of like explain that. That way, we could have mm. had like a better cap on this ant-man trilogy because yeah. like, I, like yeah. as a trilogy i i think it still functions and like it, it is like the most consistent and cohesive across all three movies at least i think um yeah. out of like all the trilogies that we've gotten so mm -hmm. yeah like i you know you can i can like live with it being like an ending but also i understand that was not like the intended purpose for it yeah. so uh yeah, I guess that is like that's kind of like I I the book ending thing was was cool again very Iron Man three uh but at least yeah. Iron Man three felt like a final movie in a trilogy this mm -hmm. does open ended to an extent so yeah yeah because we the last shot of the film is him eating that cake and just ending yes right because his, his yeah. uh, old boss made the cake uh Amanda yeah. this is the perfect segue. So <laughs> into getting into this mid and post credit scene and starting with you first to set the scene we are meeting the console of kings which is as griff kind of alluded to earlier is the idea of these kings coming together and he's i mean every time he goes to timeline he duplicates himself so at this point he's, he's established so many thousands versions of himself and this particular console is, is uh, led by immortus we have uh, Ramatot, and we have, uh, which I believe was like the the scar uh, Scarlet version of Kang. It might be someone else. I know in the comics he's like a red suit, but this one was like a little bit more mechanic. But they're having the conversation that this exile version of Kang, to their eyes, has been killed. And that's why they're bringing them all together, because this is a serious threat. So now this threat is on 616, our world, our prime Earth for the Avengers that seem to conquer all. But now they have to conquer these Kangs and the... Coliseum of Kings and his all the variant different versions, Amanda. And that's where, again, if I'm an actor as Jonathan Majors entering the MCU, you know, yes, it's great to have this as a career booster, but I also want to show my acting chops and the fact that he's going to play all these different versions of Kang and we're going to see him throughout the multiverse and see him throughout these projects is exciting to me. But your thoughts on this post credit scene and what do you think it could mean moving forward with all these uh, Kangs now targeting 616 Earth? I'm very excited. That's yeah. all I can really say because within <laughs> that, not barely a minute of a scene, you yeah. saw Jonathan Majors Fleshing change character does. like five or six times mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. barely even saying much. And that's what's so incredible for him is that he gets to have fun with this, yeah. but also be a, a chameleon um, and give us so many variations of this one character and that's what's really exciting i don't i don't know obviously considering what the other 
post credit scene is. Mm-hmm. We understand that like it's it's connected, obviously, to to Loki um, and that stuff. So it's just the fact that that he could pop up like Thanos at Literally. the end of every post credit. Like yep. he's gonna do yep. that, oh. right? So for Man, for me, that's <clears throat> the, that's kind of like a peeve. For me, though, mm. just because it feels like the exact same setup that we had for like since Age of Ultron two and like to Infinity mm. War, technically, that's the only thing that I, it's a very minor thing. But I was thinking about it. I'm like, it yeah. took them ten years to, to build, build to, that yeah. to build that, and now we're gonna get it not even in three. Yeah, we're, we're running to Secret Wars, which I think is a detriment to the MCU. If I'm being honest, I think it's a little bit too soon for that. Um, yeah. And and honestly, I think to your point though, I think uh, hopefully they're going to only use these Kang variants to pop up into these more multiversal stories. Like I wouldn't expect yeah. Kang to pop up in Daredevil, Born Again, or to pop up on yeah. Captain America or Thunderbolt. But yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if he does have an appearance on the Marvels, especially you know that that's going to be the the last film for like yeah. ten months for another MCU. So I wouldn't be surprised if he pops up there. But uh, Griff, man, your thoughts on these new variants and the idea is setting up that these Kangs are going to target this particular Earth that has defeated one of them, which is a rarity to them, and it's something that they see as a threat. So now they're going to bring the war to the 616, which I think might point Mm. us towards that multiversal war that we learned about in Loki. Your thoughts, man? Yeah, um, to Amanda's point, yeah, it does get me kind of concerned that they're just sort of like repeating a Thanos sort of thing. Um, I... (sighs) I don't know. I I'm already more interested in Kang as a as an antagonist than I ever really was Thanos. Um, mm-hmm. And I think they're kind of taking what they did with Thanos and they're improving upon it this time around um, by actually properly introducing him Introduce, in yeah. a film right. instead of just right. having him be like a post credits tease. And so we actually yep. get something from the character. True. Um, True. Instead of just waiting for Infinity War, which. Uh, you know, Infinity War is a great movie where Thanos is like the protagonist and he wins mm-hmm. in the end. Like mm-hmm. that, like I, I think that's an interesting thing. But like getting, you know, someone like Kang in Quantum Mania, and then and then you know seeing how he'll you know pop up and other things like like you know Loki season Loki. two as we see yeah, from the other post credit mm-hmm. scene. That's mm-hmm. that's interesting. And then just just from like a, a character point of view and like uh, Jonathan Majors playing him, I, I mean. I understand why someone like majors would be, you know, kind of stoked to do something like this. I mean, right, I, I have right. no idea if he is excited, but I think By all accounts, him, all the interviews I'm seeing, he's pretty stoked, man. He seems. Yeah. Excited. Which I mean, fuck, of course he would be. He's going to make, yeah, yeah. you know, millions of dollars and everything like that. Being <laughs> oh, yeah. the MCU, It's going to change yeah. his life, 100%. but also like, from a creative standpoint, I mean, he gets to play different characters yes. every single every time single he's time. playing yep. Kang. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be like, you know, a James McAvoy thing with Split. And I think that's just like yeah. a really interesting yeah. uh, thing for an actor. And I, 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 that's what I'm most looking forward to is just seeing how he yeah. plays into all of these different versions of Kang. We get a little yeah. bit of that in that post credit scene. And like it is like he's going all over the place. And I'm like, yeah. wow, this yeah. is like uh, this is like a he range of, of here, acting. Go down there, we'll go wild. Yeah. 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 So pretty, like that's. Be awesome. Yeah, that's that's exciting to me. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't, if I wasn't a little nervous about how they're going to build up to it, what the threat is it going to be? Is it is it yeah. going to be like the Infinity Saga, but with like a new coat of paint, aka like the multiverse, or you yeah. know what's yeah. sort of going on here? And then, but and then also like what the, what you know what's going on with the Shang Chi stuff and like the end of that post credits with like uh, Captain Marvel. Rings, yeah, and, a lot of us speculated that we thought the Bangles and the Ten Rings were going to be maybe um, a focal point in this film with him. You know, yeah, and there, they, but that wasn't really yeah. mentioned. Yeah, I don't know. It just feels like they 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 didn't necessarily have like a cohesive plan and to be honest i don't think they necessarily did when they were doing the infinity saga either it just kind of they were able to make it happen as they went along and i think here it's the same approach but there's just so much going on and like i they have direction this go around at least in terms of like kang and right. his, uh, you know, ambitions and his his end goal. So at least we have yeah. that. We just kind of got to figure out how all these other pieces sort of 
fit into it. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I assume they have that planned out, but it is kind of oh, weird yeah. that it, it was like such a rocky start to get here. Yeah. 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 No, I yeah. agree, man. And and I'm hopeful. Again, I'm just thinking about Amanda's comments and your comments on like when, you know, how they're going to use him. Just thinking of the timeline roughly in my head. Yeah, I think yeah. the next, besides Loki, I think that's a, a forgiven at this point because we'll get into the second post credit yeah. scene. But I would think the Marvels would make sense. Intergalactic space bangles. We know yeah. she can transport from one universe to the next. So I'm, I would be not, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't pop up there. But then when you think about the next time we'll see a big event film would be Captain America, New World Order, which I don't see Kang fit into that and no. follow it up with Please, uh, no. Thunderbolts. Yeah. And so, see, yeah, that's, that's see, that's the weird speed. sort of Where, like yeah. literally everything you're saying right now. I'm just sort of like, well, okay, so what are you, what are you tying in here? Because you've yeah, got like yeah. the, you know, you've got the exactly. Thunderbolts and like that in, in Captain America and the whole like that thing going yeah, on. And then you have grounded stuff. Yeah. 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 And then, and then, you know, to your point about the Marvels, like, I don't really want to see Kang pop in there because I just saw him in Ant Man, and so it's I'd like to see them kind of do their own do thing their own and thing. fight their own antagonist. Yeah. I'm right. sure like it'll like they'll reference him or something, but and then you already know Guardians is like just that's the that's yeah, its that's, own yeah, thing now. They're just wrapping that again. up. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's done. So yeah. Yeah, if like the next or, time I mean, we hey, see him, did is, meet Thanos in Guardians One, so I don't know if it would be an opportunity to have Kang pop yeah. up randomly. And yeah, I, I think you're right though. I think Adam Warlock, yeah, I, High Revolutionary, it's enough on their plate. Yeah, yeah I'm just because yeah. because I don't think I don't think James Gunn would have come back if if he yeah. was like, okay, we got to work with this in here and you got to do that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Nah. yeah. We'll see, guys. But hey, the second post credit scene to me. If you all don't know, Loki is my favorite Disney Plus show. I love the show so much. And this to me is, I don't think we've gotten, a, and I think this is safe to say that, that scene that we're going to break down is going to probably be a scene straight out of season two of Loki. I don't think we've seen mm-hmm. something like yeah. this since Captain America capturing Bucky with Sam. And I think that was in one of the Ant Man films. But the setup to yep. scene, yeah. we're somewhere in the 1900s and we see this Victor Timely type of uh, character on stage giving a presentation. And we look from the audience perspective, and there is Tom Hiddleston as Loki, and you know, Owen Wilson as Mobius, and he's like, "Hey, man, what's, this guy doesn't seem so scary." And we just see the fear in Loki's eyes, like, "No, trust me, he is someone to be fearful of." So, I mean, this one, I mean, it's obviously going to be a tie-in to Loki season two, which makes me excited. Which I am to assume that this Victor Timely character, which from the comics, is actually a character that Kang disguises himself as a human to study the earth and to study the, the, the ages of the heroes during that time. And he becomes like a corporate uh, tech guy and has kids and they're Kang. So it's, it's a really interesting character and, he, and it takes place in Wisconsin. So I'm, I'm safe to assume that that's probably the main threat in season two of Loki is capturing this Victor timely individual, but Amanda, I love me some Loki. Does this post credit scene get you more excited for Loki season two uh, or maybe less excited? It, it does if we get more answers. I like yeah. answers. Let's just figure this stuff out with the multiverse storyline because mm-hmm. I think y- you guys know that's been like the, my most frustrating like thing about all of phase four is not having answers to any of these timelines and why they are the way they are. So yeah, yeah I'm I'm excited to see Owen Wilson back. I really loved his character. Yeah. Um, we get more time with everyone. We get more of a backstory with with Kang as well. Well, this particular variant. So, mm-hmm. well, mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a really fun season two. But seeing how terrified Loki is of this one variant, like yeah. it's going to be a doozy. I just hope that you know, this sticks the landing and it's not like as rushed as season one, even though I did, I did like Loki more than other MCU shows. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. Cause I, I miss them. I miss, uh, I miss the dynamic between oh, Loki such and Loki. So. And, and also too, yeah. the supporting cast, you know, um, you know, woman Mushaku is B115 yeah. or 14 or whatever she is. Ramona, uh, which again, has some uh, romance with Kang in the comics. So, yeah. Man, what, what are you thinking, Griff, on this post credit scene? Does it get you more excited and amped for season two uh, for, for Loki? Or is it just like, ah, oh, man, how is – where is Sylvie? Where, I don't know, how is that time to that? <laughs> and all that. Um, I, I don't know if it gets me more excited for Loki season two. I, I, my, my investment in the Loki series is not 
based on how it connects to like you know the multiverse the mcu yeah. all that stuff like that mm-hmm. i just really like the show like as is is like this kind of like like marvel's version of like doctor who or where whatever with yeah, very much so, you know yeah. exploring yeah. loki no. as a yeah. character um if anything i would say that maybe i'm a little nervous that season two is gonna lose some of that in mm. favor of like focusing more on like okay we have this loki show and this is going to be the bridge to establish like the kang stuff and whatnot and i'm like that's all well and good but man like that first season of loki worked because of how it unpacked like you know loki as a character and like all the different variants and whatnot so as long as it doesn't lose that i'm very excited for loki season two because that was like outside of i think moon knight that was probably my favorite of the the mcu shows so yeah um yeah yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I am interested in, in like this variant and like, you know, where this is gonna fall. Like, I, I, have, I have no idea. Is it, yeah. is like this? Is season two of Loki gonna be like they're going after different variants of Kang okay, like yeah. each week, or is it, you know, a case where like they're spending most of their time with this variant? I, I don't know. But. Yeah, good question, man. Because there was a rumor out there that it might be the main villain would be uh, um, a Sylvie older version of herself or something in nature. Mm. Uh, so we'll see, man. Again, I'm I'm stoked because I just love and I know that we lost a showrunner who did season one and they replaced yeah, her. The, yeah, so that could be a little bit nervous, but nervous. listen, as long as we got Natalie Holt back, that's one of my favorite scores in the yeah. MCU. Yeah, yeah for Loki. sure. So I, I think good. we're in good hands, but. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, that's the film. That's our thoughts. That's the post credit scenes. And before we head out, just some a uh, few last topics. And I want to get your thoughts on this, Amanda. Where does the <laughs> Ant Man trilogy rank for you amongst Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, not including Love and Thunder, Spider Man? And then where does this individual film rank for you amongst the other Ant Man films? Oh, God. Okay, I'll do the Ant-Man ranking first, like the trilogy. I would put Ant-Man first, the first one, and then... Okay. Actually, it would be Ant-Man, Ant-Man and the Wasp, and Quantumania. I don't know. I feel like it's the exact order of the trilogy. I, like, yeah, that great. it's... Uh, yeah, I don't know why. I, I really... I liked Quantumania, but I think mm-hmm. for me... And I, I this is going to start a war. Um, but it reminded me of what they did with civil war and what they did with civil war kind of you you guys know how like it bothered me that it didn't really focus on Stephen bucky that much and that they had Mm -hmm. the sokovia accords and all of that so it feels like they could have focused on cassie and scott and it could have been like a bit smaller and contained for the trilogy because again, like it's supposed to be one, two, three, close it off. And like Griff said before, they did, you know, you guys, they left it open-ended in that case. And it's bigger than what Scott had handled in the first two films. So it doesn't look like a trilogy, you know, and it doesn't feel like a trilogy. Um, So it suffered the same way that civil war did for me um, Mm -hmm. because they had to set, other things up for the rest yeah. of the phase unfortunately so that's my only peeve with quantum mania it's still like one of my favorite trilogies so i'd probably say it'd be cap because it's consistent ant-man's next because again it's consistent mm-hmm. um iron man is not consistent for me i think iron man 2 just went to the bottom of the barrel for me <laughs> for that case um but i love iron man 3 and that really boosted it for me so i think i put iron man next thor after that that oh no i put thor last and then i put spider-man over thor i think that's how i would do it because okay. i didn't no so cap I, uh wait Ant-Man. can't we'll do cap ant-man spider-man iron man and then, and then thor. thor yeah okay. sorry because gotcha. I, I forgot i'm like i didn't like homecoming but i love far from home and no way home so why am i ranking it that low but that's how i would kind of order the the uh the trilogies for me awesome awesome appreciate the list there and griff man uh no pressure but again how would you rank this amongst the other three and as far as the other five trilogies again going back to our conversation almost two years ago did it end up being the most consistent in your favorite trilogy out of the avengers yeah i um i I, I get where Amanda is coming from in terms of like it being the civil war of 
the Ant Man movies in terms of it like doing other things and not yeah. really focusing on like wrapping up a character's arc. Uh, I I uh, I'm a bit torn because like part of me agrees with that, but I also feel like it was it 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 may it kept like the Ant family in the heart of that at its core, mm -hmm. and so I feel like thematically you can chart a very clear path from the first Ant-Man to this film. And I think it, it it actually does work as like a pretty consistent and satisfying trilogy capper. Cause I mean, ultimately like the, the, you know, Scott is like the most selfless Avenger and all of that. And he's like constantly yeah. worried about, you know, his daughter not viewing like, like him not living up to his daughter's expectations of him. But really, you know, as we find out through the movies, what, his daughter loves about him is the fact that he's willing to help out people in need. And so I think in this film, they kind of push that a little bit. They're like, okay, you're selfless. You've, you've done all these things. You've sacrificed so much now. Like, and we, we know who you are as a person. Will that remain consistent? If you go to a completely other reality, are you going to remain true to who you are? And I think that mm -hmm. is, yeah the ultimate test test for Scott in this film. Is he going to still be that hero that looks out for the everyday people, even if they're fucking made of broccoli in this realm? And the answer is yes. And so I think like a lot of people might look at this as like, well, Scott doesn't really go on an arc. And I think he does go on an arc. He, he, he kind of toys with the idea of like, Oh, Cassie, we got to get the hell out of here and like look out for ourselves because he's lost so much time with her. And when we get to the end and Cassie's like, no, that's never what I wanted. Like, I wanted you to keep being who you are. And he kind of has that, you know, reaffirmation of that. And, and that to me is like a very powerful punctuation point on like Scott as a hero through these films. Like, it doesn't matter where he's at. He's always going to be someone who's looking out for the less fortunate and the people who are in need, even if it is in the quantum realm. And so mm -hmm. that I, I think that's where I look at quantum mania. Like, yes, there's set up for phase five. Yes. There's some like messiness with like the tonal inconsistencies and the rushing and just sort of like the, you know, the writing where they don't like too much exposition writing, I think was a big thing for me. It just yeah. felt like they were explaining a lot of stuff to you instead of letting you feel it and show it. And, and that started to grate on me a bit. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, like it, it did feel like a, a proper, like surprisingly did feel like a proper Ant-Man movie while also doing some, you know, MCU setup and, and stuff. Yeah. So for me, this is my favorite trilogy in the MCU because of that consistency, right, because hey. of how it, it like the characters stayed yeah. the same. It was the same director throughout th yeah. the three films. So besides John Watts, vision. it's the only one that had. Yeah. 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 Well, we don't talk about that trilogy. But. <laughs> Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but oh yeah, that's, right. I mean, outside of John Watson. Yeah. Like, um, but I, yeah, so I, I liked that. And then I, I liked that they were finally able to take the, the ant fam to the quantum realm and like yeah. have some fun with that a bit. Um, so yeah, I think for me, quantum mania, like nothing's touching the first Ant-Man movie in my mm -hmm. book. That's just like, that's a such a great film. Um, and so for me, it goes Ant-Man, Quantum Mania, and then just bare like Quantum Mania just barely edges out Ant Man and the Wasp. Yeah. I think just because I, I honestly, if I if I had to pick a reason, probably Jonathan Majors. Gang, he's yeah. the only yeah, yeah he's the only reason why I give the edge to Quantum Mania because Ant Man <laughs> and the Wasp is more contained. It's simple. Yeah. It's it's very like it, it doesn't have too many lofty ambitions and it executes those very well. But it also doesn't have like the greatest villain, um, which is yeah. where I think. Mm -hmm. quantum mania kind of excels it, it has many ambitions it doesn't necessarily yeah. do all of them all that well but it, you know i felt something at the end and jonathan majors was great so yeah that, that's who are the ant-man films and then for the trilogy ranking ant-man yeah. uh, it's so tough for me because cap and iron man are kind of neck and neck i hate Ooh. civil war and i hate iron man 2 <laughs> But like, but, but like the Winter War. Soldier, my, my dude. I love this. I love I, this. I, no, let him talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, I, I think, I, think I, I, I do have to give the edge to to Captain America because mm. if I look at my ranking, um, 
the first Captain America and the second Captain America are like basically in my top 10. Same. Um, and the yeah. first Iron yeah. Man, I think, is just barely outside the top 10. And then, gotcha. well, I mean, Iron Man 3 is the best Iron Man movie. So there's no question there. So yeah, uh, Ant-Man, <laughs> Cap, Iron Man, what are, what are the other two? Is Thor and Thor then Spider-Man? And, uh, Captain Thor America. And Spider-Man. Oh, it's Thor and Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I got to go Spider-Man and then Thor just because yeah, you sound like, so no. enthused. That Spider-Man's <laughs> going for it. I, I, honestly, okay. both both of those that. yeah, both, both of those, those trilogies bottom are broken. broken. Yeah, they're yeah. broken. Oh, oh wait, what about the Avengers? Well, I was I, I left that's the Avengers like a, off yeah. because yeah, yeah. Was, yeah, those are yeah. You know, the mega yeah, that is, yeah. So <laughs> great, great stuff, guys. Um, I, and I'm my list is similar to Griff as far as the Ant Man trilogy. Again, not being the biggest Ant Man fan, but I will give 2015 Ant Man that uh, rights because I do love that film uh, out of all of them. That's my favorite. And I think it's the most concise and focused. And I, I don't want to you know throw this out there, but I do feel like the Edgar Wright isms to me makes it better than the other two Ant Man films. When oh, Peyton for sure. Reed fully gets the rain. Uh, no disrespect yeah. to Peyton Reed, but I, I definitely felt that uh, Edgar Wright. Uh, presence in the first one, but that is my number one Ant Man. Number two for me is Quantum Man because I do think it is, uh, you know, Kang puts it over the top for me. And bottom of the barrel, I recently watched so for me, uh, Ant Man the Wasp is like almost in like my 20th tier. I am not a fan of that film at all. And I watched that <laughs> a couple nights ago, no. not to make this to a long thing. Oh my goodness, <laughs> did not like Ghost, did not like the jokes, did not like Sonny Birch, who was just randomly in the film. I love the him. FBI informant. <laughs> oh my goodness. That film gave me a headache when I revisited it the other day. No. Um, so I'm not a fan of that one. So, uh, but as far as trilogy, it's cap all day, every day for me. Um, the best trilogy. Spider Man, <laughs> number two for me. Iron Man, Ant Man, and then Thor. That's I how. take personal offense to that's that list. That's how we're doing it, man. That's yeah. how we're doing it. But wild, listen, you can go on for many, many, many hours. <laughs> there's even more announcements that came out from Marvel yesterday with Kevin Feige saying they're going to space out projects. They just said it for the 19th time of confirmation that uh, Deadpool 3 will be rated R. There will be a new president in Captain America New World Order in the form of Harrison Ford. So that's going to be interesting because he's played a president quite a few times in his career. So get off my airplane. I'm going to I'm gonna be excited for that. And uh, Phase 5, even though it might have started off on a rocky start with this new film, I'm hopeful, ladies and gentlemen, that we can get back to form and get excited for these projects again. You know, because it is feel like these projects are overlapping each other. They don't have time to breathe. We're not getting the buildup isn't there. So I like the fact that when it comes to July uh, until the next film is like 10 months. So I'm glad that we get that oh, nice. gap between films. And hopefully yeah, that God. gap applies to the TV shows, too, because I, I feel like we just need to get excited again. But also secretly, I'm looking at this as an opportunity for DC to come in and just take over. So secretly, not downfall on Marvel, but I'm just hopeful that James Gunn, Peter Safran can... Bring the DC to the front, front, forefront as it should be. But neither here nor there. That's another conversation for another day. Amanda Griffin, thank you guys for joining me today. It's I always love talking to you all. I can't wait to chop it up with you again and, and catch up and see where we're at in the multiverse and see how things are playing out. But wrapping it all up, starting with you, Amanda, where can people find you? And what's next on your platforms and reviews we can look forward to? Yeah, well, this is always fun. I love being here with you guys, and I'm just I'm happy that we can love Ant Man a bit more after this movie. Just just a bit more. Um, you guys can always follow me over at AMX Indie Reviews on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and uh, and TikTok, and uh, you can follow. You can uh, check out my website, CandidXCinema.com as well. And my YouTube is Candid Cinema. Right now, I have my Quantum Mania review up, spoiler free. Um, and then I have The Last of Us again coming up. Uh, I'm going to do some awards predictions just because I've been doing awards season, which is exhausting because it's so long. It's so long. Please don't make it in March anymore. Uh, but yeah, come on over. And uh, I think I'm going to rant a bit more about how underrated Ant-Man is because he needs <laughs> he needs love. He does. So there you go. And <laughs> just yes, me, listen. me and Griff the whole timeline is gonna yes. be like, you guys. The <laughs> Ant Man fans are coming loud. And there they Ant are. Fans. The Ant fans. fans. Hashtag. We are the least obnoxious Marvel fans. That's all I'm gonna <laughs> it's say. It's true. We just Griff, love our man. family, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Griff, my man, tossing it to you. Like I said, it's always great to see you, man. Where can the people find you? And when is the next wonderful video essay you have lined up for the people? 
Yeah, no, it, it's great to be on here. I, I'm actually thrilled that we were able to have this conversation with the three of us because of like, you know, basically charting all the way back a couple of a uh, couple of days ago and or not days ago, like, you know, months ago, but actually probably even more of like a year ago when we were talking about quantum mania and all that stuff. So it was nice to, you know, put a cap on all that with this this conversation. And I'm honestly shocked I was as positive as I was. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> Uh, you can check out the Film Speak channel. Um, uh, the next video, I actually think it's tomorrow. Well, actually, I, I don't know when this video is coming out. Uh, Thursday, uh, I am, I mean, I have my Ant Man video already out, but then Thursday, I have a video on the Flash trailer, why I'm excited about that movie, all the cool stuff that I, I you know, thoughts and theories, breakdowns I have on that in video essay format. You can check that out. Speaking of DC kind of, uh, you know, taking the lead here, I'm. <laughs> I think the flash looks like it's going to outdo the multiverse thing that Marvel's oh, trying yeah. to do. So there's that. Um, and then uh, I guess, depending on when this comes out, the the following week uh, will be my quantum mania video essay and all that stuff like that, where you'll just hear me, I, I guess be on the defense for this movie, I, which is like, again, so bizarre to me, but uh, yeah. yeah, let's, uh, let's do it. You can follow me on Twitter at uh, Griff Schiller. So, yeah. Awesome. And I mean, to your last point, Griff, yeah, as we're recording this, this film currently stands on Rotten Tomatoes, which, you know, I don't I don't hate Rotten Tomatoes, but I also know how it works. But it's it's 53 percent out of 158 reviews, which makes it the second worst reviewed Marvel cinematic film uh, next to uh, Eternals, which don't even get me started on that one. That beautiful, awesome film that people just didn't like, but, you know, teach their own. But. Listen, for myself, Griffin, and Amanda, thank you all for watching this awesome discussion. Um, I will be talking to Griffin and Amanda in the future because, again, DC's coming, man. DC is finally coming. But I'm hopeful that Marvel can keep the train going as well. But, again, uh, Amanda's information can be found in the description of this video as well as Griffin. And before you all leave, hit the thumbs up, share, comment, do all that stuff with the algorithm. We really, really appreciate it. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, you all have been awesome. We'll see you in the next one.